have Senate coverage here on C-SPAN 2. Now a business meeting of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee. Chairman Dan Burton called this meeting for members to debate whether to grant immunity to three witnesses who have been called for its campaign fundraising hearings. Good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. The committee is assembled today to consider numerous issues regarding the investigation, and then we will consider two pieces of legislation reported by the Government Management Subcommittee. The committee will consider three resolutions directing the House General Counsel to apply to the United States District Court for the District of Columbia for orders of immunizing from use in prosecutions the testimony and other information provided to the committee by Man Lin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wang. Before I begin my opening statement, I want to let the members know how we will proceed today. First, I will make an opening statement, and then I will yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, the ranking member. Members will be recognized under the rules for general debate. Without objection, member statements will be included in the record. Also, I want to welcome to the dais Mr. Richard Bennett, the committee's new chief counsel. Dick comes to the committee from the law firm of Miles and Stockbridge. He has a wealth of experience as a former U.S. attorney in Maryland and prior to that as an assistant U.S. attorney. Welcome to the committee, Dick. It's great to have you on board. I now recognize myself for as much time as I may consume. Today our committee will begin the process of explaining to the American people how foreign money was funneled into our political system and how illegal contributions were made during the past several years. Our investigation is focused on determining who knew about or was involved in these actions and why and how these actions were undertaken. However, at the outset, I would like to note that over 50, 50 relevant witnesses are not available to the committee. This brings unique challenges to our task. Of the 58 people not available to the House or Senate investigators, 36 have asserted the Fifth Amendment privileges before this committee or the Senate committee. 11 witnesses have left the country, and 11 foreign witnesses have refused to be interviewed by investigative bodies. Too often when we call upon witnesses to explain these issues for the public, we are met with a sound of silence. This committee has not been able to hear testimony from John Wong, Mr. Wong, a former senior Commerce Department official and DNC official who served as Vice Chairman of Finance for the Democrat National Committee, has asserted his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. This committee has not been able to hear from Charlie Tree. Mr. Tree, a presidential appointee, has left the country and has been abandoned by those who courted him at the White House with red carpet treatment and gladly welcomed his company and money through last Christmas. The president himself stated that these individuals were his longtime friends. Wong visited the White House over 90 times between 1993 and 1996. Mr. Tree visited the White House 23 times between 1993 and 1996. While neither this committee nor the Senate nor the Justice Department has been able to hear from John Wong or Charlie Tree with a grant of immunity, we will be able to hear from Charlie Tree's sister, Manlin Fong. We'll, we will also be able to hear from a friend of Ms. Fong's who will be able to inform the public of important information about Charlie Tree's DNC fundraising activities. With immunity, we will also be able to hear from David Wang who will be able to inform the public about John Wong's DNC fundraising actions. Given the unprecedented barriers our investigative efforts have met, it is necessary for us to utilize the immunity process to provide information to the American public. To begin this process, we will today consider a vote on immunity for several individuals who are willing to explain to the committee and to the public what they know of the patterns and the practices of these two key Democratic National Committee fundraisers and longtime friends of the President of the United States, John Wong and Charlie Tree. 
The witnesses we are asking immunity for, Ms. Manlin Fong, Mr. Joseph Landon, and Mr. David Wang, are really victims. And anything else, go, of an, anything else goes White House, and a don't ask, don't tell Democrat National Committee. These witnesses were put in the middle of this fundraising mess by people they trusted who had friends in high places. These witnesses have been cooperative, and we though owe them our thanks for their assistance. Last week, the Justice Department informed this committee that it does not oppose the granting of immunity to Ms. Fong, Mr. Landon, or Mr. Wang. Granting immunity to key witnesses is an important tool in both criminal and congressional investigations. It is clear from the Justice Department's quick agreement with our immunity request that the witnesses we wish to hear from should not be the subject of any legal liability for any involvement they may have had in these matters. I am pleased that the ranking minority member has indicated bipartisan support for grants of immunity to these witnesses. These individuals were used by others as conduits. These individuals voluntarily cooperated with the committee. They provided important testimony and documentary evidence of some of the fundraising activities of John Wong and Charlie Tree. I am pleased that with the granting of immunity, they will be able to tell their story to the American people. As we go forward, grants of immunity will continue to be a necessary tool enabling us to get information to the public. Over the years, Congress has frequently used grants of immunity to conduct productive oversight and satisfy the public's right to know. The Watergate Committee requested immunity grants on over two dozen occasions. Likewise, the Iran-Contra investigation requested grants of immunity in over two dozen instances. The congressional investigations into the assassinations of President Kennedy and Martin Luther King requested immunity over 160 times. The Senate Governmental Affairs Committee has already granted immunity in nine instances, some even over the objections of the Justice Department. It is my hope that this investigation can proceed in a bipartisan manner. This has certainly been the history of congressional investigations when Republicans were in the minority. As my colleague Chris Shays has noted on numerous occasions, Republican participation in investigating our own administrations was the norm rather than the exception. The national security and serious foreign policy matters possibly at stake make it necessary for us all to join together and aggressively address these issues. While it is true there have been more subpoenas issued to Democrat sources than Republican, this is because following the money trail has resulted in more leads in connection with DNC fundraising. We have and will continue to follow the foreign money trail wherever it leads. In fact, this week the committee issued another subpoena to the National Policy Forum regarding Ted Siong, an Indonesian businessman who allegedly funneled foreign money into both Democrat and Republican coffers. The public has a right to know how all of this illegal foreign money made its way into our political system. We are in this investigation for the long haul, and we intend to get to the bottom of these complicated issues. These are important matters regarding our economic and national security that cannot and must not be neglected. If foreign money infiltrated our system, regardless of where it went, it is our responsibility for the benefit and safety of our nation that the American people and the American people to follow through on where the facts lead us. The committee has identified three witnesses with firsthand information who are able to shed some light on the matters under investigation. Today, we will take up resolutions to immunize these people and allow them to tell their story. This will be a step-by-step -step process that will often be painstakingly slow as we try to fit each piece of the puzzle into this troubling picture. I look forward to beginning this process with all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. I now yield to my colleague, Mr. Waxman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are going to have before us in a, in a minute a resolution on uh, immunity for these witnesses. Uh, did the chairman make his statement on that, or does he have another statement when we bring that up? The reason I ask is in the interest of time, I'll address the immunity question when we bring that up rather than now. I will have some brief, I will have some brief remarks regarding the immunity, but... Uh, okay. That, thank you very much. Well, I, I won't uh, give an opening statement, and we'll discuss the immunity issue when the resolution is brought before us. I do want to make a couple of points. Uh, I think we have to be very careful when we're making accusations or characterizations 
for instance i've reviewed the statements by these three witnesses and those statements did not substantiate the claim made by the chairman that they know anything about the d n c and that they can shed light on the practices of the democratic national committee but more will come out when these people do come in and actually give us their testimony and just so we can have statistics available to people we have had uh, chairman burton has issued a total of 429 subpoenas and document requests, 120 requests for depositions and formal interviews. This is a total of 549 information requests in connection with this investigation. 419 subpoenas and document requests and all 120 deposition and interview requests were targeted at alleged Democratic fundraising abuses. This is a total of 539 information requests targeted at alleged Democratic fundraising abuses, and contrast that with only 10 subpoena and document requests, and none of the deposition or interview requests targeted at alleged Republican abuses. It's hard for me to think that this committee investigation is following the money trail wherever it may lead. Mr. Chairman, I have more comments on the uh, question of immunity. And then when we get into the issue of depositions, I'll have more comments on that issue. But I have no further opening statement and yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman from California. As I already stated in my opening statement, uh, I support granting Manlin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wang congressional immunity today because I believe their testimony will help shed some light on some of the improper campaign activities of the 1996 election cycle. Members should also know that the Department of Justice, which fully cooperated with the committee, does not oppose the proposed action we're going to take here today. Without objection, I will include in the record correspondence between the committee and the Justice Department regarding today's proposed vote. Before we begin general debate, I want to remind members of some of the ground rules regarding today's meeting. A number of members felt it was important to hold today's debate and vote in public session, and I have tried to accommodate that view. That being said, members should not publicly debate the substance of the merits or the merits of the witnesses' testimony. As members should know, the witnesses have each been interviewed by the committee staff investigators. You have been provided copies of transcribed interviews and interview reports. Despite the facts that I believe these individuals would not be prosecuted for violations of federal campaign finance laws, I believe it is incumbent upon the committee to protect the witnesses and not release potentially incriminating information about them prior to their actually receiving immunity from the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. This means that a public discussion of their testimony must be avoided. Because debate about whether to grant someone congressional immunity usually involves a discussion of possibly incriminating material, such grants of immunity are typically considered in executive session. The Senate Governmental Affairs Committee recently proceeded in executive session when it considered congressional grants of immunity. Therefore, if members insist on discussing the substance of the witness's testimony, I will politely remind them of the ground rules. If we find that debate must include the substance of their testimony, I may be forced to suspend debate and move the committee to resolve into executive session. Okay. Okay. These ground rules being clear, uh, I will yield to Mr. Waxman, but before I do that, uh, I now call up the three immunity resolutions and ask unanimous consent that they be considered in block. And without objections, the resolutions are considered as read. Mr. Waxman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, we have now before us uh, resolutions to grant immunity uh, to these three witnesses. I want to thank you for delaying last week's committee meeting so that the Justice Department could uh, provide us with its views on immunity. And I also want to thank the Attorney General for her immediate response to our request. She has informed us that she has no objection to our granting immunity to them. It's uh, no secret that uh, I have a low regard for this committee's campaign finance investigation. It has been unfair, it's been partisan, and basic rights and procedures that have been uniformly observed in other congressional investigations have been ignored here. When Democrats have complained about the subpoena process or other issues, 
the Republican majority has outvoted us without any consideration of the merits of our proposals. Simply put, we didn't matter because they didn't need our votes. So there's a strong t temptation today when our votes do matter for immunity to respond with partisanship. But we're not going to do that. Evaluating immunity issues is one of the most serious responsibilities we have, and I'm proud that every Democratic member has insisted on considering the chairman's request for immunity on its merits. Immunity is a powerful tool. Ordinarily, it should be reserved for witnesses who have new information. I do not think that immunizing Man Lin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wong from prosecution meets this test. The statements the majority has obtained from Ms. Fong, Mr. Landon, and Mr. Wong don't seem to significantly add to what we already have learned in the hearings by Senator Thompson on July 29th. I support immunity, however, because these witnesses have been put in possible legal jeopardy. Chairman Burton's staff questioned them in secret without attorneys present or any understanding of the implication of their statements. They were assured they, they weren't in any trouble. And according to one witness, they were told that they, quote, really didn't need lawyers and that their interests would be protected. This is not how a serious or credible congressional investigation should be conducted. We are considering immunity for three witnesses that are at best minor figures in the campaign finance investigation. They know little that seems relevant to our investigation, but they risk possible prosecution without immunity. I disagree with the decision to call them before the committee, but since the chairman has already done that, our best course is to immunize them, listen to their testimony, and then move on to more significant matters. Mr. Chairman, I will support the request for immunity for those reasons, not because we're going to learn something new, but because these witnesses have been put in jeopardy by the mishandling of this investigation, and I don't think it's fair to leave them in a position where prosecution may be possible and they may be in legal jeopardy. I have time, and I want to yield to any members who want to make further statements, uh, because I know I still have time on this, uh, my opening, uh, as we get into the debate. And well, so if the gentleman would wishes, yield. wishes to uh, uh, further talk about the issue, uh, Mr. Lantos, I yield uh, uh, whatever time I might have. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding, and I want to indicate I will vote for immunity uh, for these witnesses uh, to protect them from the consequences of a bungled investigation. These three witnesses were treated unfairly, they were misled, and their rights were violated. I am not surprised that this is the case because I took the time and trouble to attend a number of depositions and spent hours listening to the questioning. I find that these depositions, in many instances, go way beyond the confines of this investigation. They pry into the private lives of witnesses. We have had instances where people were asked whether they have ever taken drug tests, what kinds of automobiles they drive, then the names of their girlfriends. I'm at a loss to understand what campaign finance violations may have to do with the names of individuals' girlfriends. Uh, I have uh, uh, discovered that witnesses were asked whether they knew about any legal action pending against other possible witnesses. So the three witnesses to whom we are about to grant immunity are just one set of examples of a bungled, poorly conducted, inappropriate investigation. These people were advised, as uh, the ranking member indicated, that they do not need uh, an attorney. They were misled. They were unfairly treated. They were improperly treated. 
I will raise um, at the next round a broader issue. The bulk of the witnesses appearing both before the Senate committee and this committee were of Asian origin. Now, I believe that there is a grave danger that stereotyping and Asian bashing will become, and in many instances have become, part and parcel of this investigation. There is a long history of discrimination against Asian Americans. We all remember chapters of that history, perhaps the most shameful of which is the incarceration of 70,000 United States citizens of Japanese origin during the Second World War. This investigation, perhaps inadvertently, has clearly contributed to stereotyping and race baiting. As one who is singularly conscious of this issue, I want to call attention to this issue because Asian Americans have as much right to participate in the political process as do Americans of any other origin. Deliberately or otherwise, Asian Americans have been the target of both of these investigations to an unacceptable and overwhelming degree. A large group of Asian American organizations have filed a petition <clears throat> uh, to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, a petition which I strongly support calling for hearings into this entire matter. The last thing this country needs at this stage is an attempt to whip up racial tensions and Asian bashing. These hearings clearly have contributed to a climate of xenophobia, which we ought to avoid. I want to thank my friend. I hope to reclaim my time, and I know that our time has expired, but I want to join with you in your expression of concern. I doubt that the opening witnesses for this congressional hearing uh, were selected at random. They were selected because I believe that they represent, just by virtue of their race, the inquiry that has, is filled with innuendo. Uh, Charlie Tree's sister Mr. Speaker, is simply I is his sister. Mr. Speaker, I object. And uh, I, I do want to join right you that we, must, we uh, must be cautious in how we approach I this object. investigation. Uh, my time has expired, and the gentleman Breaking can object order, on please. his own time. Yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Does anyone else uh, care to be heard on this? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Shays. I was a, a member. Was recognized for five minutes. I was a member of a committee chaired by Mr. Lantos, and this committee had hearing after hearing about Japanese-owned businesses, and never once did I ever complain that all the people before us were Japanese businessmen, or ever make a complaint that somehow we were race baiting. And I find the allegations that the last two gentlemen have made deplorable. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to echo the, the comments from the gentleman from uh, Connecticut and say that, that while I certainly have a great deal of respect for Mr. Lantos and the work that he's done, particularly in human rights, uh, I too am offended that both he and the ranking member have somehow called us racist or accused us of race baiting simply uh, because we're investigating uh, uh, what, what Newsweek broke a year ago, what the Washington Post has been speaking about, what the LA Times has been speaking about day after day after day. I think this really shows, once again, how desperate members of the Democratic Party are to change the subject instead of reviewing the information before them. And I would hope that as we go through this hearing, uh, that, that we can maintain some civility and that charges of racism and race baiting uh, towards Asian Americans uh, isn't commonplace because certainly I think uh, most reasonable people understand that we're just going where the information's leading us. I yield, I'd like to yield uh, uh, some time to Mr. Barr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, uh, I'm not outraged by these allegations. Uh, I, th I think it's laughable. 
uh, it's almost comical that uh, when we first have the opportunity after the Democrats on the other side uh, appear, appear to have agreed with us that it is appropriate to proceed forward with the investigation and uh, have joined with us in securing uh, the uh, process uh, for immunizing these three witnesses that uh, right off the bat they, they launch into uh, an absolutely silly uh, and outrageous uh, uh, allegation of, uh, of race baiting. Uh, and I would just uh, hope that uh, members on the other side would, uh, uh, would admonish their colleagues to get us back on track and focus on the investigation that is before us which has been conducted uh, under the aegis of uh, our new chief counsel uh, in a very, very professional, straightforward manner. Uh, it was interesting, Mr. Chairman, that uh, one of the members on the other side at a discussion uh, last week uh, criticized us for taking the time to proceed with the immunization uh, request properly, uh, saying that that was evidence that the panel was in disarray. Uh, and I think he used the term Keystone Cops. Of course, had we not done that, we would have been criticized by folks on the other side for proceeding precipitously. Obviously, there is no pleasing those who want to use these hearings for partisan purposes. Uh, I commend the chairman for moving forward, and I commend the chief counsel for placing this investigation on track where it ought to be, and that is to move through our legal system and uh, to carry out the oversight uh, responsibilities of this committee uh, without, uh, without raising or being sidetracked by absolutely laughable and specious arguments such as those we've just heard from the other side. I thank the gentleman from Florida for yielding. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Da. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, say firstly that I, too, am prepared and willing uh, and will cast the votes to immunize the first three witnesses that the um, committee's majority has brought forward uh, to testify. And uh, I think it is of note that notwithstanding uh, all that has been said in the past, about Democratic attempts to obstruct uh, from the committee's uh, investigation that uh, what you will have is a unanimous, almost unanimous support for uh, this effort to move forward. And that what we really need to do is to have the same level of support to broaden the inquiry so that we are more evenly pursuing all of the information that is available about improper and illegal activities. I'm pleased that the new uh, general counsel's on board, maybe he can help assure us that in future depositions that we won't stray as far afield as what is clearly has happened. Uh, improper questions about people's personal relationships, uh, asking questions about subject matters clearly uh, unrelated to this committee's jurisdiction uh, are activities that I'm sure the chairman or the general counsel would not want to have their good names associated with as part of a professional investigation. So we on this side are prepared to vote in support of immunization. I think that the concerns raised uh, by, uh, by the ranking member that we have a more uh, evenly dispersed uh, share, uh, uh, search for the truth and information through subpoenas and requests for information is one that the majority should take uh, under a strong consideration because today's level of cooperation from uh, our side of the aisle is something that I would hope uh, would speak well of the fact that we can work together uh, and to try to expeditiously uh, and efficiently uh, con conclude this investigation. Because many taxpayers think this is a waste of money, that you have the Thompson hearings, that you have the Justice Department going on. So if we're going to conduct an investigation on the House side, we should conduct it so that it brings credit to the House uh, and to this committee. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'll be glad to yield to I, I want to uh, underscore your point. Uh, I believe that uh, the overwhelming vote of the Democrats, if not the unanimous vote of the Democrats, will be to support immunity. We do that as a, uh, on a bipartisan basis, and we do it also with the hope that this investigation will get back on track and not be used for partisan purposes. That has not been the case, as I've indicated in my view up to now. Uh, we still hope now with the new chief counsel that we can see a, a more professional investigation, one that is fair and one that will in fact follow uh, abuses in campaign finances wherever they may lead and not only uh, look at uh, a partisan, from a partisan point of view with Democrats. So I, I want to underscore your statement. The motion before us is to grant immunity and I would urge all my colleagues uh, to vote for this motion. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Does uh, the gentleman yield back the balance of his time, Mr. Patan? 
Yes, I do. Mr. Fatah. Uh, gentleman, yield. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yield uh, to Mr. the Chairman. gentlelady from New York. Okay. I, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding, and I would uh, like to be associated with the comments of, of Mr. Lantos, Mr. Waxman, and Mr. Fatah. And I, I join them in supporting immunity. The Justice Department does not object, so neither do I. And I believe that uh, they should be granted their request uh, in the interest of moving this process forward. More importantly than immunity for these people, I might suggest permanent immunity for all members of this House. We could accomplish this by reforming campaign finance laws. If we close the loopholes, ban soft money contributions, and come up with some fair agreements by which we can bring our messages home to our constituents, every member of this House would be immune from crossing any fine line, immune from accepting any questionable contribution, and immune from the influence of special interest. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, I support this request, and I, I feel that uh, the type of immunity uh, uh, that we could achieve by passing campaign finance laws are some of the things that we should be looking at also in these hearings. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? Mr. Hastert. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very briefly. You know, I think we need to get down to the business at hand, and that's to move this investigation, to move it in the most bipartisan way possible, and to uh, actually, for both sides, to take advantage of the consul. We have uh, Mr. Bennett is a, is a consul. Uh, he will make himself available to members of the minority as well as members of the majority. Uh, I would hope that both sides take advantage of that uh, so that they have complete access. Uh, it doesn't do anybody good, any party good, to throw epitaphs across the aisle. We need to go forward. I think immunity is the proper thing. As far as relationships, uh, I would hope that the, the consul from here on out um, really purges what those questions are before they're asked. But in the case of relationships with people, uh, even those folks who are, uh, we're granting Im immunity to, two of them have a relationship. So, in some cases, that's inappropriate. Some places, it's not. We need to move forward. We need to make this as the most appropriate and, and focused investigation we can. Uh, we have the credibility of this committee and the House at stake. I hope that we can all move forward in a bipartisan way to get the job done. I yield back. Mr. Lantos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Two points. Um, first, while some members on the other side might consider the question of Asian bashing ludicrous and outrageous, clearly the organizations representing Asian Americans do not. The petition filed with the United States Commission on Civil Rights was filed on behalf of all of the leading organizations representing Asian Americans. They feel that there was Asian bashing. These organizations include the National Asian Pacific <coughs> Legal Consortium, the Organization of Chinese Americans, the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, the Japanese American Citizens League, the Korean American Coalition, the Philippine American Foundation, the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, the Chinese American Alliance, the Asian Americans for Campaign Finance Reform, the India Broad Center for Political Awareness, and so on. So while it may be very easy, if one is not an Asian American, to dismiss this item as ludicrous and outrageous, in point of fact, organizations representing Americans of Asian background felt sufficiently motivated to file a petition with the Commission on Civil Rights. And I think it ill behooves any of us who are not Asian Americans to ridicule their petition to the Civil Rights Commission. The second point I would like to make to my friend from Connecticut is that I'm very proud of the fact that we held hearings when I chaired the subcommittee of this committee on the systematic policy of Japanese-owned cor Japanese corporations to discriminate against 
all American citizens, but particularly women. As my friend will recall, a glass ceiling was reached on the basis of the evidence we uncovered in large numbers of these organizations by women who could not rise above a certain level in those corporations. The purpose of those hearings was to expand the opportunities for all American citizens not to engage in, in race baiting, which is the issue I called attention. Would the gentleman yield? I'll be happy yeah. to yield. But the gentleman knows I have extraordinary respect for him, and he knows that I was a very willing participant in all the hearings that he conducted because of my respect for him. I don't object to organizations making those accusations. I object to you making accusations to other members in this committee that we, in fact, are involved in anything other than trying to get at the truth. So one, that's what I object reclaiming to. I, my, I reclaiming just, my time, I want to remind may my, may reclaiming my time, if I may. Thank you for your courtesy. May I reclaiming, no, reclaiming my time, I would merely um, might like to mention that the facts speak for themselves. The bulk of the witnesses before the Thompson Committee and the bulk and the, and the first three witnesses we will hear before this committee are Asian Americans. This is a fact. This is an inescapable fact. Many of the media have dealt with this issue. Many of my colleagues have dealt with this issue. In point of fact, affiliates and subsidiaries of foreign aid of foreign owned corporations have made vastly greater contributions to both political parties than these issues that we are dealing with. A Canadian-owned corporation gave $2 million to the political parties. An Australian-owned corporation gave $674,000 plus a million dollars to the California Republican Party. Brown and Williamson, a British-owned tobacco company, gave $642,000. None of these foreign-owned affiliate and subsidiaries of corporations have been subject of any inquiry by either the Senate committee or by this committee. As a matter of fact, last July, the Federal Elections Commission levied the largest fine in history on a foreign contribution, and that contribution was made by a citizen of German origin. There, he has not been hauled before either committee. It would be absurd and an escape from reality to argue that there is not an Asian tone to these hearings. Now, whether this is inadvertent, accidental, or otherwise, uh, is up to each of us to judge. I thank the chair. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Cox. I thank the chairman, and I'd like to uh, take us to the top of the day's business uh, and add to the chairman's welcome of our new chief counsel. Uh, Mr. Bennett has a very, very distinguished background. I know that uh, he has been working very, very closely with the majority and the minority staff uh, and uh, intends as uh, he continues in his position to work closely with all the majority and minority members to make sure that uh, this investigation uh, is in future what it is not this morning, and that is uh, a bipartisan investigation. Second, uh, I would like to uh, add uh, the obvious to the statements of all the members, minority and majority, this morning that I too intend to vote for immunity for these witness, witnesses that uh, shall next come before our committee. And I want to uh, congratulate uh, the committee staff uh, for doing some very, very good investigative work uh, in setting up this opening hearing. Uh, we will be hearing from Charlie Tree's sister because Charlie Tree is currently under the protection of the Communist government of the People's Republic of China. And we cannot seem to reach him through a Justice Department subpoena, through a Senate subpoena, or through a House subpoena. Uh, and on the subject of girlfriends, uh, the second person whom we shall uh, grant immunity to, and I, this is not a legal term, but it is the uh, male friend of Manlin Fong. That is one of the people who will be before our committee because that was one of the people involved in the money laundering scheme. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are told by the ranking member that these people know little, yet we have yet to hear their testimony. We are told that we will learn nothing new. What I would like to hear from members, majority and minority of this committee is their concern 
about the daily reports that something very wrong is going on in the executive branch of our government. Every day brings new news reports of illegal foreign payments made to the executive branch of our government. That is what this investigation is all about. I have listened patiently and I think with courtesy to the statements made by some of the minority members this morning, including the ranking member, and I have heard not one expression of concern about illegal foreign payments to the executive branch of our government. You can check the transcript and see if I'm wrong. I've heard not one word of concern. I ask the ranking member of the minority side to join us, not just in a vote for immunity, but to join us as full partners in this investigation. It is vitally important to restore the faith of the American people that laws will be enforced, laws already on the books, that we do this. It is all well and good to talk about passing new laws. The president is uh, very anxious to do this, Gentlemen, to you talk about new laws. But we have existing laws against foreign payments to the executive branch of our government or to political campaigns. We have existing laws about money laundering, so-called conduit payments, straw men, and so on. And it is the violation of these criminal laws that we're investigating right now. Finally. Gentlemen, uh, from on California. the question of uh, immunity, it's important to know what these people have to say. It's also important for people to know that uh, it ought not to be a routine thing for us to grant immunity. Uh, since Watergate, there have been nearly 300 requests for con congressional immunity. It is not uh, an unusual thing uh, for us to request immunity. Uh, but uh, on this committee, I hope that we will grant immunity only when, as here, uh, we find people that are very relevant to our investigation. Certainly, Charlie Tree's sister can tell us a lot about Charlie Tree himself. Uh, these three can tell us a lot about John Wong and Charlie Tree. Uh, but also, we have discovered people that were never interviewed by the FBI, that were never contacted by the Justice Department, and therefore, in whom the Justice Department can have uh, no prosecutorial interest. This is a perfectly appropriate situation for granting immunity, which is why I imagine the Justice Department reported back to us promptly uh, that they did not wish uh, to interfere with our investigation. Uh, so this is an appropriate circumstance, but uh, I, for one, would like to see people put behind bars for violating the laws of our country, and I do not wish to see uh, routine grants of immunity, and so I think that collectively uh, the majority of the minority here are exercising Gentlemen, sound and good judgment. Uh, but I also wish to take this uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yield. And uh, I yield back the balance of my Will time. the gentleman yield? Gen the gentleman yields back the balance of his time. We have a vote pending on the floor. Uh, we'd like to move as expeditiously as possible to uh, voting on this immunity request. Do uh, we have more members that wish to? Uh, well, the chair suggests then, since we have more members that do want to speak, that we uh, go vote right now and come back as quickly as possible and uh, conclude the debate and get to the vote. So we will stand in recess uh, and get back as quickly as possible.
On the day of the hearing last Wednesday, the House had a heavy schedule of votes. You'll notice the committee will break several times to vote during this hearing. Now, however, during this recess, some upcoming programming information. Later on this morning, the Census Bureau holds a news conference on income, poverty, and health insurance for the nation and the states. We'll hear from the Bureau's Chief of Housing and Household Economic Division. See live coverage beginning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Here are some of the other events our cameras are covering today. White House Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles will be on Capitol Hill. The Senate Judiciary Oversight Subcommittee is reviewing procedures in the FBI's crime lab. Senate Democratic Leader Tom Daschle will provide an overview of what the Senate will be working on this week. At American University in Washington, D.C., a discussion on executive privilege in the Clinton White House. And also at the White House, the President and First Lady will present the National Medal of Arts and the National Humanity Medal. We return now to the Rayburn House office building where the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee held a business meeting on its investigation into campaign fundraising. Members are filtering in after a vote on the House floor. In a moment, Chairman Dan Burton will gavel the committee back to order and lawmakers will resume their discussion on granting immunity to three possible witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, first of all, I want to say that I fully support the action that the committee will be taking today uh, to grant immunity to th these three witnesses. I think it's the appropriate course of action. I would like, though, just briefly to, uh, to respond to several comments made by members on the other side. Um, Mr. Cox said that he had not heard a single member from this side of the aisle say that they were concerned about the allegations of um, foreign money coming into this country in particular into the executive branch. Um, just so the record is clear, um, I am concerned about allegations that foreign money um, comes into our political process at the executive level and at the congressional level. Uh, so I'm concerned about the allegations um, levied against the administration and I'm also concerned about the allegations made against members of Congress uh, in the same vein. At the same time, I'm also concerned about allegations uh, pertaining to the amounts of tobacco money um, that has been given to the parties uh, and the allegations that those somehow may be related to the, the sneak attack uh, in the budget bill that provide the tobacco industry a huge benefit. Uh, and I'm concerned about all of those allegations because I believe that each and every one of those allegations goes to the core of the credibility of this institution. And I think that our role has to be to examine those allegations uh, in their entirety. And one of the complaints that I think many of us have had on this side of the aisle um, is that we in all candor don't think that that's the purpose of this committee. Um, we believe, at least I believe, um, that the purpose of this committee uh, is to, to look at allegations against the administration, to look at allegations against the Democrats. Um, and what I have said many, many times, I certainly don't approve of everything that has gone on. Um, I don't know whether it was legal or illegal. That's something we should examine. But I will say that, that the money that's been raised by the Republican National Committee and Republican candidates does not come exclusively from widows and choir boys. And I think that if this is going to be a credible investigation, we have to look at that as well. I also want to address very briefly the, the whole matter considering immunity, because I was uh, the person I think that my good friend Mr. Barr was referring to that referred to the situation in this committee as a Keystone Cops situation. Mr. Cox, Mr. Cox uh, in his statement, correctly pointed out that, that hundreds of witnesses coming before Congress since Watergate have requested immunity. That being said, it should have been no surprise to the majority uh, on this committee that these three witnesses, once they had the opportunity to talk to an attorney um, would make the same request. And I think that the, uh, the mishap that we experienced last week was a direct result of the failure of the majority to recognize that no one um, who faces even the specter of criminal activities um, wants to appear before a congress congressional committee without first seeking immunity. Um, they finally 
learned that that was something that was prudent for them to do, and they acted accordingly. So um, it is my hope that we can proceed forward on a bipartisan basis. I think that, that the actions taken by Mr. Waxman last week in signing the request along with the chairman seeking um, the Justice Department's guidance on the immunity issue shows that the minority is very interested in truly working on a bipartisan basis. And again, it is my hope that the majority um, shows the same interest because if that happens, then I think we will finally establish the credibility that has been lacking in this committee. And I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. We'd like to move as expeditiously as possible to a vote, but I don't want to cut off debate. So, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one second. Does, do we have anybody on the majority side that seeks time right now? Mr. Barr? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the last speaker talked about a, a mishap. Uh, I'm at a loss to know what he's talking about, and I, uh, I'm really just not sure what mishap there was. Uh, this is the same member that was on a program that called uh, the, uh, the, uh, our effort to secure a te uh, uh, immunity uh, Keystone Cops uh, last week. Uh, there's no mishap uh, here at all, Mr. Chairman, and uh, if uh, folks on the other side think that going through the proper procedures to seek uh, immunity for witnesses who have requested it in the normal course of events is a mishap, uh, then I might direct him to, uh, to review some basic uh, rules of the House and basic court proceedings and basic rules of, uh, of uh, legal proceedings as well. Uh, when a witness uh, requests uh, immunity, as these witnesses uh, did, uh, apparently after, uh, after that being raised with them by outside parties, uh, it is only prudent uh, for uh, this committee to take the action that brings us here today. Uh, there is no mishap whatsoever. I strongly suspect also that members that view this, uh, the request for immunity and us moving through the process as provided by rules and laws, uh, that they would be among the first to uh, criticize the chairman and criticize the chief counsel uh, had we not moved forward with the request for immunity, but had called the witnesses up here and forced them uh, to, uh, to assert their privilege against uh, uh, testifying without immunity. Uh, they would have been among the first to uh, criticize us for railroading, uh, for kangaroo justice, and so forth. So I think, Mr. Chairman, that the American people can see through these specious charges on the other, sides, on the other side. Uh, and uh, we'll focus instead on what brings us here. Uh, this, uh, this hearing has nothing to do with tobacco money. If uh, folks on the other side are interested in tobacco money, then they ought to uh, testify before the Commerce Committee or one of the other committees with jurisdiction over tobacco money. Uh, this, uh, this hearing uh, has to do uh, with uh, the very heart and soul of our judicial, of our electoral system, our political system uh, in this country, where there are indeed, uh, as uh, I believe the gentleman from California noted earlier, uh, virtual daily uh, revelations uh, uh, of uh, foreign influence, uh, possible foreign money coming in, uh, of uh, violations of uh, our federal laws, our criminal code, and other provisions of our election laws uh, in the conduct of the, uh, primarily in the conduct of the presidential campaign in 1996, uh, then uh, one has to wonder why folks uh, are so uh, quick to uh, try and derail this investigation. The steps that we are taking, Mr. Chairman, to reemphasize uh, are those that, uh, that are provided for in the oversight responsibilities of this committee. Uh, the steps that we are taking with regard to seeking immunity for these witnesses are standardized procedures that ought to be followed and that we are following. Uh, I think it is also mindful uh, we ought to keep in mind uh, what the gentleman from California mentioned earlier, that while in this instance uh, we are seeking a vote on immunity, uh, and uh, have already secured the, uh, uh, the so-called approval of the Department of Justice, uh, not interposing any objection to the seeking of, um, uh, to our uh, seeking immunity, uh, that this is uh, something that ought not to be followed in each and every instance, uh, because whenever you do that, uh, you run the risk of allowing somebody to skate or to not be prosecuted for serious violations of federal law. So we need to look at each and every instance, as I know our chief counsel already has done and will be doing, to determine uh, in the best interest of justice and the best interest of our oversight responsibilities uh, that we look at the, the evidence that uh, individual witnesses are bringing forward and weighing that against the possibility that, uh, that we may be allowing somebody who clearly has violated a federal law to, to, go, uh, to go without prosecution. 
In this instance, I have every confidence based on what I have seen so far and after uh, extensive discussions with Chief Counsel that the decision that has been made uh, is not a mishap, as the gentleman from Wisconsin keeps talking. It is a very appropriate uh, step that is called for uh, within the circumstances of these witnesses, given the fact that the evidence that they are providing is very important evidence and also weighing against that. Uh, the fact that the Department of Justice has indicated that these individuals would not and do not fall within its prosecution guidelines and has interposed no objection to the, uh, the seeking of immunity, which is the, the vote that brings us here today. So uh, again, I would like to commend the Chief Counsel and the, and the Chairman for mo moving prudently uh, in accordance with established procedures in this case uh, and would urge us to focus on uh, the, the evidence. Uh, and the process here rather than uh, keep trying to pull these, these, uh, these uh, proceedings off on tangents such as racial prejudice or uh, an argument over uh, uh, tobacco uh, and really focus on the, the specific evidence and the process here that is very, very important for the American people, uh, Mr. Chairman. Now you back. Good. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman uh, from Kanjorski moves the previous question. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the, the Mr. question Chairman. is on the previous question. I All just want to make sure that there was no other member who wanted to be heard because I wouldn't. Well, want to the, the mo a motion's on the floor, and uh, we have to uh, vote on the motion. Uh, all those in favor of moving the previous question will signify by voting aye. 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 Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The previous question has been ordered. If uh, since there's no more debate and the previous question has been moved, the question is on the resolutions granting congressional immunity to Man Lin Fong, Joseph Landon, and David Wang, offered in block. All those in favor of the resolutions will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed will signify by saying no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds of the membership of the committee having voted in the affirmative, the resolutions are agreed to. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Uh, on Gilman. that issue, may we have a recorded vote? A recorded vote has been requested and uh, will be ordered. The clerk will uh, call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Portman? Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent? Aye. Mr. Condent votes aye. <coughs> Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? 
Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Bogoyevich? Aye. Mr. Bogoyevich votes aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Mr. Ford votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Aye. Mr. Cox votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Portman? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. Portman? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes yes. Mr. Schiff, Mr. McIntosh, Mr. Scarborough, Mr. Shattuck, Mr. LaTourette, Mr. Portman? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, no, there were 30... One second, Mr. Wise. Mr. Wise, you're not recorded? <laughs> Mr. Wise votes aye. Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 37 ayes. The motion is carried. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Two thirds uh, having voted uh, in the affirmative, uh, the resolutions are agreed to and we will proceed.
Uh, the I understand that Mr. Waxman has a motion on the desk uh, to publicly release all depositions taken by the committee to date. Without objection, the motion shall be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I now recognize Mr. Waxman in support of his motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This motion would require the committee to release copies of the depositions that have been conducted in this investigation. So far, the committee has deposed 48 individuals for over 200 hours. Some of the depositions have lasted longer than 10 hours. Under this motion, these depositions must be publicly released. This motion is necessary to remove the veil of secrecy that has surrounded the House investigation. The Senate investigation has been proceeding in public. The Senate has held dozens of public hearings and has revealed what they have learned about campaign finance abuses. In the House, however, we have spent millions of dollars conducting a totally secret investigation. The public has no idea what we have learned. At the outset of this investigation, Chairman Burton said that the investigation would be conducted in public so that the public would learn the true facts. As the chart, uh, chart says, I want to quote the chairman, the major purpose of a congressional investigation is to illuminate the facts and not to hide them. Congressional investigations are by their nature far different from a judicial inquiry where a grand jury conducts all matters secretly. Public disclosure of the facts is the essence and in large part the purpose of congressional oversight. The American people have a right to know the facts in these matters." End quote. This is from a floor statement by Congressman Burton on April 29, 1997. This motion which I am making would do exactly what the chairman said we should be doing. It would stop the secrecy that has characterized our investigation and let the public know what we've been doing. The public has a right to know how we have spent millions of their dollars. For months, Chairman Burton and others have been making accusations about a conspiracy by foreign governments to corrupt and infiltrate this administration. These are very serious allegations, but they have not been backed up by any facts. Now is the time to release the depositions so that the public can judge for themselves whether these allegations are substantiated. A concern was raised by the majority that disclosure of the depositions would disclose personal information about the witnesses. This is ironic because it was the majority, not the minority, that sought this personal information in the first place. The motion which I've introduced, however, addresses this matter. It provides that personal information, such as Social Security numbers, should be redacted before the, re the uh, depositions are released. I think it's important that we get these depositions out in the public view, that uh, the American people be able to judge for themselves uh, what uh, information we have and whether some of the allegations that have been tossed around so cavalierly can be backed up by evidence. I would ask for support uh, for this motion and uh, urge my colleagues to, to uh, vote for the resolution. Gentlemen, is there the further discussion? Mr. Chairman? Gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've reviewed the motion that's just been passed out to us. Uh, uh, I had advance notice yesterday that such a motion might be offered. Uh, it's been made available to this committee only just now. Uh, and I've given some thought to this. Uh, uh, I appreciate the notion that we ought to make public as much of what we uncover in the course of this investigation as possible. I find it ironic that uh, we are being criticized for conducting the investigation uh, with circumspection uh, in confidence because we are doing so pursuant to protocols adopted uh, at the request of the ranking member. Those protocols are a first. This committee has never adopted them before, uh, but it was at the request of the ranking member that we do so, and they limit very, very strictly the release of information from this committee. Uh, the reason that the ranking member gave for imposing these restrictions on the committee was that this information should not make its way willy-nilly out to the street corner, that if we're asking for sensitive information from the White House, from witnesses, uh, from people in foreign lands, uh, that we ought to use some judgment. 
about what we put out and what we do not. There's an analogy here to information that's contained in uh, investigational records of the FBI. In fact, the FBI hopefully is investigating some of these things. Uh, but this White House surely is aware of the uh, perils of making public uh, raw FBI files or raw investigational material. So our protocols, I think, wisely uh, set up a five-person group on which uh, the minority is represented by, uh, in chief, uh, the ranking member, uh, to determine whether or not uh, information in specific cases ought to be released. Uh, alternatively, any member, majority or minority, can release any information from any deposition that he or she wishes to release uh, by making it public in the course of a public hearing, provided, of course, it's germane to what the hearing is covering. Uh, so, uh, Would the gentleman uh, yield to me? Since the ranking member has not yet asked uh, for uh, a convening of our five-person group, and the ranking member knows that I've talked to him on the floor at great length about this. Uh, uh, I think we ought to get that group together. It ought to meet routinely, and this is a perfect assignment for it. Uh, I think uh, we ought to make depositions public uh, wherever possible, uh, that we ought to make that information public in the course of hearings, uh, and we ought to make it public outside the hearings if we agree that that's the right way to go about it. Uh, but I note that uh, if we're concerned about the rights of the deponents, that is, the people whose depositions are getting taken, the people who we're investigating, uh, this motion uh, that the ranking member has offered cuts off their rights. It says that even before they get a chance to complete their work of reviewing the deposition, even before their attorneys have cleared it, even if it contains transcription errors, we're going to push it out. Uh, on October 8, 1997, whether or not they've reviewed it, it's public. With the uh, gentleman that, yield. that is clearly inappropriate, and for that reason, uh, along with uh, basically the reason that the ranking member advanced at the time we discussed the protocols, uh, that this committee should not be the subject of an article such as on the front page of the Hill today about leaks uh, that are coming out of the Senate, uh, that we ought to uh, exercise good judgment when we conduct a serious investigation about uh, law breaking by the executive branch in which the president himself is implicated, the vice president of the United States is implicated, the attorney general is now uh, a focus of significant uh, concern and investigation because the Justice Department uh, for months has not looked at these records, has not conducted the investigation properly. And when uh, all of these things of, of great weight and magnitude are the focus of our investigation, we should not simply uh, pump it all out into the public, uh, even when the deponents themselves have uh, not had a chance to review it and their attorneys have not signed off on it. So I, what I'd like to suggest, and I'd like to offer uh, uh, my own motion uh, after uh, we have a vote on this one, is that uh, we get our five-person group together. Uh, it's been set up precisely for this purpose. It's been set up under the protocols that the minority insisted that we have in the first place, uh, that were cleared with the parliamentarian. And uh, if that is unworkable for any reason, I can't see why it should not be, then come back to the committee and, and address another procedure. But uh, repealing the very protocols uh, or the substance or the meaning and purpose of them that uh, uh, we had just adopted for this committee seems to be very odd indeed. At once, uh, uh, we were saying we can't make these things public. Uh, this committee cannot be trusted to handle this information. Uh, and then uh, having adopted protocols that are very strict to keep this information uh, from leaking out, except uh, when it's put out by minority and majority agreement, we come back and say this is a terrible veil of secrecy on the committee. Uh, it's completely inconsistent and lacks uh, common sense. So I'd like to uh, urge defeat of this motion. Do the Chairman, gentleman yield? Back. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Chairman? You yield Mr. Please. Lantos? This is the highest Democratic welcome. Mr. Lantos? Right. I'm just waiting. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I yield to the ranking member so he may respond. I thank you for yielding. This is the second time my friend from California, Mr. Cox, has referred to me personally and then refused to yield to me. He's absolutely incorrect in both instances, but in this case, He's absolutely incorrect about the protocols and the way this, uh, these information from depositions have been handled in the past and can legally be handled now. Uh, the protocols, which I opposed, gave the uh, chairman the ability to call a group together 
when there's confidential information uh, that, that the FBI or, or some other national security agency uh, resists the idea of having disclosed. Uh, the protocols give the chairman the power to disclose that information, uh, and he could seek the guidance of uh, five members uh, uh, from, from this committee as a subcommittee to advise him. But we're not talking about uh, anything other than depositions. We're not talking about documents. And the protocols refer to documents. When it comes to depositions, depositions have in the past been publicly disclosed. Now, what is our precedent for it? We only had one precedent, because we've only had one other time in the history of this committee where the committee took depositions. And that was in the last Congress, when we took depositions on the investigation for the travel office and the FBI matters. Uh, and in that case, we released the depositions and made them public. In that case, we had a total of 72 depositions that were taken and released the, to the public in connection with the travel office and the FBI files investigation. And they were released in the middle of the investigation. They were released, uh, and I want to quote again from Chairman Burton, uh, in August a year ago, 1996, I think this is a very important part of the investigation. We have had these depositions taken. I really believe that they ought to be part of the committee record and part of the congressional record, and I don't see any reason why they should not be put into the record, end quote. Uh, the precedent has been to release these documents, the, release these depositions. Furthermore, that group of five cannot, or the chairman, cannot release depositions. It must be vote by a vote of the committee. We have not delegated that power to the chairman. And under the rules of the House, that, chair, that power uh, is part of the committee's responsibility. I see no reason why those depositions ought not to be made public. We would uh, excise personal information. We would give the, uh, uh, the, the, the person deposed and that person's attorney a chance to uh, review the deposition before it's released. But unless you've got something to hide, it ought to be made public. A hearing of this importance ought to be a public hearing, not one conducted in secrecy with people subjected to hour after hour after hour of depositions where they have to answer questions that may not even be pertinent to the investigation itself. So I want to correct the record, and I would have been pleased to do so had the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox, given the courtesy for an opportunity for me to clarify this matter to him, either in a private conversation or in this public setting where he incorrectly um, stated what the situation was with regard to deposition. I yield back to my colleague, Mr. Lantos, and thank you. I strongly support the motion of the gentleman from California. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. The investigation by the Senate committee and this committee stand in very sharp contrast. The Senate committee's investigation is in the public. The American people, those who wished, could see what was unfolding. Would the gentleman uh, yield? Not the Senate is point. not releasing their deputies. Not at this point. <clears throat> Nine months of witnesses being deposed, and those of us who attended some of these depositions find that the depositions are fishing expeditions probing into personal affairs of the individuals, nothing to do with the question of campaign finance abuses. I find it puzzling and disturbing that the majority would find it worrisome to release these depositions. What do we wish to keep from the American public? We on this side are asking for the release of all depositions to the American people so they can make their own judgment about the value they have received for the millions of dollars that was spent, some of us feel wasted, by majority staff in pursuing these witnesses. It seems that there is no substantive argument since we are prepared to eliminate from the depositions as we release them all personal information. The depositions to be released will all deal with issues. 
one would think that in an attempt to get at the truth, our friends on the other side would welcome the opportunity to make public what witnesses have said, witnesses they have called. Presumably they thought that these witnesses had some useful information to convey concerning campaign finance abuses. We approved of those depositions. Some of us participated in those depositions. We found those depositions profoundly disappointing and we are calling for their release so that the American people can see how their money was spent. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Chairman? We have a vote pending on the floor. It's, uh, uh, Mr. The, Chairman? Mr. Chairman? It, it is the request of the chair that we go to the floor and vote Chairman? now, and when we come back, Mr. we'll Chairman? continue debate okay. and try to uh, conclude this, uh, this debate as quickly as possible. Mr. Shays, do you, you have a question? Mr. Shays? You, 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 you want to... Uh, uh, just very briefly, I know we'd like to go to the floor. Uh, I think it's very important that we focus on why it is that you do not want to release the depositions before the witnesses testify. Witnesses, oftentimes, that is to say witnesses who have violated the law and might want to cover up their violation of law, uh, witnesses want to uh, uh, get together and coordinate their testimony in order to deceive the Congress and to deceive the American people and to deceive the Justice Department and so on. Uh, if every single witness gets to talk to every other witness before we take their testimony under oath in this committee, uh, there is no way in the world that we're going to get at the truth. What the Senate is doing is releasing the depositions at the time or immediately after the people testify. Any member of this committee can release any depot. And that's exactly the precedent that the ranking member referred to. That's what happened uh, in the last Congress. You release the, the depots in the course in of the hearings. If he, if he and the truth me. is that uh, what you're after right now uh, is uh, merely an attempt to uh, obfuscate. Uh, what we're trying to do is get to the bottom of this. As I said at the outset, uh, you know, I, I'm prepared, frankly, to uh, uh, be as uh, uh, complimentary as anybody on this committee of honest efforts from the minority side, but I have not heard one word all morning about concern about illegal foreign payments to the executive branch of this government. Concern that people such as Charlie Tree and the people that we granted immunity to today have broken the criminal laws of the United States of America. It's quite clear. Will the gentleman and, yield and, for and reading the rules? Unless I see that concern, it's pretty clear to me that what we're looking at here is an attempt to you know, throw a stick in the spokes here and bring this whole investigation to a halt, which I for one will not stand for as the vice chairman of this committee. Chris. Chairman, the gentleman yield. The gentleman Thank yield. you. I'd Chairman? be happy to yield to Mr. Barr. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the other side was, was interested in reasons why in the normal course of uh, taking depositions uh, under the House and frankly under judicial rules generally, there are reasons uh, to maintain the secrecy, at least preliminarily, of such documents. Chairman, uh, the Chairman of order. California uh, uh, mentioned one. Another reason is in addition Mr. to Chairman, witnesses... the gentleman then, yield uh, for a point of order? Oh, uh, oh, no. Are we going in some sort of uh, order here? Uh, or, the gentleman yeah, has I, I have five minutes, to, and I, 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 yield yield I know, but you had Mr. Cox, and then you had another Republican speak. No, no. Mr. Chairman, I'd, Mr. I'd go to the has floor. The time. Uh, there is uh, an additional reason, in addition to the one cited by the gentleman from California, and that is that witnesses then can collude uh, their testimony if these documents are released. Another is that, as a former prosecutor, I'm well aware of instances where if these documents, such as we're talking about here, are released, uh, particularly at an early stage they can cause those witnesses to be intimidated uh, so that their testimony may change, it may be shaded. So I think there are very, very sound reasons uh, from both a legal and uh, from the stand historical standpoint of how this body, the House of Representatives, has treated these documents in the past, and I urge uh, the defeat of the amendment. I yield back to uh, the gentleman from Con Connecticut. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair uh, calls a recess at the, until this vote is concluded. We'll be back at 1 o'clock.
Congress returns to work this morning. The House gavels in for morning hour speeches at 10.30 Eastern Time. That's where lawmakers can speak on any topic. Then at noon Eastern, the House resumes debate on the federal budget. The new budget year begins Wednesday. Lawmakers are still working on several of the 13 bills that make up the budget. Today, the House will debate the funding for the Departments of Commerce, Justice, and State. You can see live coverage on our companion network, C-SPAN. Also at noon Eastern Time, the Senate returns. Lawmakers will debate a modified version of the bill offered by Senators John McCain and Russ Feingold on campaign finance reform. You can see live coverage of the Senate here on C-SPAN 2. On your screen is the chairman of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee, Congressman Dan Burton of Indiana. He's waiting for lawmakers to return from a vote on the House floor. Then lawmakers will resume discussion of the committee's investigation into fundraising during the 1996 federal elections. resume the uh, hearing. The gentleman from California, Mr. Condit, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, I'll uh, try to be brief, but I might want to stretch it out a little bit so my colleagues may want to come and respond as well. And I, I um, want to speak in favor of Mr. Waxman's motion. Um, it is my understanding that the committee rules do not allow us as members of this committee to um, release or talk about the uh, witnesses or people who have been deposed, that we're restricted from doing that by committee rule, and that in some cases, if we release the information, we may be liable um, for releasing that information. So I support this motion today uh, and find it necessary for us to do this because the com committee r rules require us to do this because um, if not, if we do this as individuals, I frankly think that's unfair, and, and my understanding is that it is possible that we could be liable for doing that. In light of that, Mr. Chairman, the taxpayers of this country are spending $2.5 million for this investigation. And I don't believe, and I believe that they don't believe, that they're getting their money's worth. We've subpoenaed 298 people including 127 that were pr uh, previously subpoenaed by the Senate Government Affairs Committee. We have taken 48 dispositions so far. 21 have previously been deposed by the Senate. 15 have been interviewed or investigated by Kenneth Starr. Mr. Chairman, I think that um, the American people deserve to know what are in the binders that are before us today, sitting in front of us, I think that we ought to open the binders and let the American people see what's in there, find out if they're getting their money's worth to the tune of $2.5 million. We ought to let the American people judge for themselves whether there is merit to this investigation, and we ought to... Um, let them know how we're spending their money. There's no um, doubt, Mr. Chairman, that I have made a point from day one. Mr. Chairman, about my concern about duplication and cost to the taxpayers of this country. This is a theme that I intend to carry out through this investigation and through these hearings. I think we need to release the information. I think it's important for us to let the American people know whether or not they feel like their $2.5 million is being well spent. It's fair. We ought not to be afraid of the information in those binders. And um, I would ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to be in favor of open and public uh, information. I yield to my colleague in California, Mr. Waxman. Well, I, I want to just underscore this point. 
It's unusual for the House of Representatives to be doing depositions. Ordinarily, we have hearings, public hearings, and witnesses are then asked questions and then they answer them. But what we have is a secretive process when we use depositions. It's not unprecedented because it was done once only before, and that was the last Congress. Now, depositions mean you can sit there and ask people about anything you want. And that is, to me, an abuse of people's privacy. And it's an abuse that would not be permitted in a public forum. You wouldn't be asking somebody about their drug practices or their girlfriends or boyfriends or things that have nothing to do with this investigation. I have a letter that I sent to the chairman uh, pointing out that over the past two months, 39 depositions have been taken by the staff on this investigation. They've lasted over 160 hours, more than four hours per deposition. Over 80 additional depositions have been scheduled. That, that, that's even dated now. And if only, very few members have ever showed up. But I pointed out there was a lack of coherent focus. The depositions frequently sought information beyond the investigation's scope. That um, questions pry into the private lives, questions were asked that relate to Whitewater. We've spent a lot of time in these depositions on the issue of Whitewater. What does Whitewater have to do with um, this campaign finance investigations? They were questions relating to democratic political strategy. Depositions that I thought were abusive to the witnesses. Now, I think all that ought to come out publicly. I've written a letter, and I'll distribute this letter to the chairman, where I've redacted anything that had to do with statements that were made in the deposition themselves, because I can't, even though Mr. Cox said it, he was wrong, I can't, nor can any single member, release a deposition. It only can be released by a vote of the committee. Let's vote to release them. There's no reason not to make it public. Uh, I, I will have my private letter with the redacted part distributed, but everything else, in fact, I'll even make it part of the, my uh, attachment to my statement here, but there's, uh, there's no reason in the world why depositions ought to be kept confidential. The process in the last Congress was to make these depositions public. Some of these witnesses were never called as witnesses before, witnesses in dep deposition were never called before the hearings, but their statements were made part of the record and they ought to be made part of the record here. Uh, last time we had, in March, first depositions taken. By May, uh, first four depositions released at the committee meeting, not a hearing. Then in August, there were 54 more depositions released. Uh, most opponents never testified. And then in September, last depositions were taken. Investigation remains in progress, according to the committee report. Uh, let's, let's, get, let's operate in the, in the, in the, in the sunshine. Let's don't operate in secret and then abuse power in secret because I submit that's what's been happening. Thank the gentleman for yielding. The gentleman yield back the balance of his time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if I have any time, I just want to remind members that the binders that we're asking to be open and let the public take a look at what's in them are setting before us. Let's open the binders up. Let's have full disclosure. Let the American people see what it is we're investigating and let them tell us whether or not they think they're getting their money's worth on this investigation. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from California. I thank the chairman. I wasn't going to get into this because it looks like just more obstruction of trying to get at the truth and uh, figure minutes uh, that we can get past that and get at the truth is what counts. But it is really, I must say, a little disturbing to see people suddenly talking about Let's have all the information in the open. Let's get at the truth. Now, the facts of life with the experience of this committee with First Travelgate, and we lived through that and spent a lot of time on that investigation, then Filegate, where we still haven't gotten to the bottom. Why not? We did not get to the bottom of this because the White House selectively would leak documents, and they didn't want the press to cover any revelations made by this committee. They just leak them out to their favored reporters. They'd appear the least harmful document, but then it was old news, and they never had to answer any future questions. Oh, this is old news. We release that. That has been the systematic practice of this administration. Now, I would like to hope, as I've said before in this committee, that when skullduggery occurs in any administration, Republican, Democrat, whatever, that the Congress 
on a bipartisan basis would go after who is playing the games, who is really behind a lot of this, who is obstructing justice. And I've really been disappointed by a lot of my good friends who I like personally on the other side of the aisle that they haven't, except for this immunization motion this morning, that they haven't really dug into this as they should be joining us to dug into it. The, we've got complete violations of federal law. Dumping those depositions open is exactly what counsel for the other witnesses want. Then they can find out what was said and let's keep our story straight and all the, the rest of it. Yield. No, I'm sorry, I won't yield on this. I've done that before and I've just found speeches that have no relevance to the subject. And the fact is that those depositions and getting the witnesses before us will show a pattern and a practice. And if I could say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, if you can get us Charlie Tree out of China, where Tom Brokaw apparently can find him any time he wants, the administration can't seem to find him anywhere, and uh, if you get the people that have been said, go travel a while so the committee can't be getting you within its reach of subpoenas and depositions, and if you can get those that have taken the fifth to avoid testifying, I might just vote for that. But the fact is we've had nothing but obstruction no matter what we've tried to do to get at the truth. We still don't have the truth on Filegate, as I said. Why were a thousand FBI files in the White House? Nixon's assistant went to federal prison for one FBI file. The White House sits there with a thousand of them, pouring over them. All happened to be Republican appointees. What were they searching for? Blackmail? They weren't searching to make them appointees, to my knowledge. And we've never gotten that because of one systematic obstruction by one White House counsel after the other, denying us the documents. And the only time they take us seriously is when we say, okay, we're moving to the floor to get a contempt of Congress. Then mysteriously, a couple of hundred pounds of documents are found either in the residence or in the attic or wherever. And as I've said, Peter Pan seems to float around the White House with documents daily. And we never know where they're going to land, but we'd like them to land here where we can get at the truth. And that's why I didn't want to say anything on this subject, but I get a little irritated by the hypocrisy I see. Will the gentleman yield? I'll yield to my good friend from Orange County. Uh, I thank the gentleman. My neighbor. Uh, I, I think we need to remind ourselves of why we're here. Uh, we're here first to get to the bottom of a lot of law breaking, and second, to put it out in the public, to put it in the light of sunshine. That's what we do. Uh, if, as, and when there is an independent counsel appointed to investigate the violations of law here, and I think it's pretty clear that an independent counsel shall be appointed, uh, even the distinguished ranking member said that he supported an independent counsel, although he wouldn't sign a letter in support of it recently. Uh, but we will have an independent counsel. Uh, and when there is an independent counsel, that criminal process will operate in secrecy. The grand jury proceedings will all be secret. Everything will be kept in the dark so the American people will have no way of knowing perhaps for years could be five six years because that's how long the criminal process takes uh, and our job will be different our job because public integrity is at stake here will be to put these facts before the American people but uh, I referenced earlier today's story in the hill uh, the headline is uh, Thompson panel probes leaks in the opening paragraph says that the Senate committee investigating campaign campaign finance abuses has ended an unsuccessful investigation of a leak to the New York Times of the deposition of former White House official Harold Ickes. Well, how in the world can you have a leak of a deposition of Harold Ickes if the facts are as represented by the minority, which is that all these depots uh, are released to the public automatically and that we ought to operate the way the Senate does. The truth is we're going to operate here the way we've always operated here, the way the Senate should be operating when they're not leaking, and that is that as we have our public hearings, which we shall do, uh, we will release, and any member on the minority side or the majority side can make this information public, uh, all of this information, but we don't want to do it in such fashion that before we take the testimony under oath, here in this committee room, uh, the witnesses can corrupt the whole process by colluding with one another, changing their testimony, uh, getting their story straight, as the gentleman from California said, and so on. That is not what this process is all about. But ultimately, yes, and ultimately very soon, in a matter of weeks and months, not years, like the criminal process, we want to put all of the results of this investigation before the American people as soon as possible. I thank the gentleman for yielding. The gentleman yield back the balance of his time.
Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Any further discussion on this uh, amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fatah? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an investigation which has been suggested as to look into uh, foreign influences into the um, elections last cycle. Based on all the information that uh, I've been privy to, including the uh, briefings uh, that uh, others have discussed, uh, it seems as though the plan, if any, was to influence the congressional elections. Yet, we seem to be focused on uh, the executive branch. This um, committee has subpoenaed and deposed uh, numerous individuals. Uh, the majority has gotten an opportunity to ask uh, thousands and thousands of questions of these individuals. What the minority suggests by this motion is that in these depositions, um, there is nothing uh, that suggests uh, wrongdoing on behalf of this administration, and that's why we want these depositions to be made public. And we should not be confused by the uh, comments here. There will be a vote shortly, and those who vote on behalf of releasing these depositions vote to release the work of the majority. That is, vote to release the questions that have been asked, the way they've been framed, the, uh, and so that the public can be aware of this. And if we're for uh, the public knowing what's going on, uh, in terms of this investigation, we should release it. Now, if there are particular depositions in which there's some uh, argument by the majority that this could uh, in, in some way interfere with the future uh, uh, efforts of the committee, then let's deal with those separately. But we should not suggest that in every one of these depositions that there's some harm that could be done by letting the public be aware of what we assert very strongly, uh, inappropriate questioning, uh, questioning on subjects not under the jurisdiction of this committee, questions that probe into the background and personal activities of people. And so we suggest and we would hope that those on the majority side um, who have said in the past that they're for public disclosure have made all of these wild allegations about the President of the United States and the Vice President. We've already been through tens of millions of dollars on previous investigations, Whitewater, Travelgate, Filegate, and here we are again, we have another investigation. Let's open this one up so that the public can see and see what the majority's efforts have been about. And you should have nothing um, to fear by public disclosure. And if there are individual cases of depositions that should not be released, let's deal with that. But let's not make a blanket uh, move here to uh, not allow the public to see the work of this committee that's taken place, in which we spent over $2 million dollars uh, working on. Now, the gentleman from California had said, suggested earlier that the minority had not wanted to have items be made uh, public before, and now that we were changing our position. I want to correct the record. The minority insisted that the chairman not be in a position to unilaterally dec disclose information publicly. We never opposed uh, depositions being made public, and what we wanted was a vote of the majority when items were to be made public. And that's what we seek by the ranking member's motion today. And I would hope that, as you found bipartisan support for immunity uh, on the earlier vote, that we might find some support on the other side, that the public might have some right to know what the committee's work has resulted in thus far. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'd be glad to yield. You know, I just think that Mr. Cox's statements are just dead wrong. It's dead wrong about what the committee did in the past. Because what the committee did in the past is release these depositions, even at meetings. I have a transcript from a, a meeting we had. It wasn't even on the, on the campaign finance issue or the travel gate or those other investigations, where Klinger said, before we begin the business at hand, let me take care of a few housekeeping chores. As the members know, the committee has been in the process of conducting depositions as provided in Committee Rule 19. And without objection, I'd like to make these depositions part of the record. Depositions have always been made public. And if the Republicans are trying to keep us from ma uh, making them public, I don't understand the reason. The reason we were just given was that somebody's going to see what somebody else said and then get their story in sync. Well, what's to keep them, if they're going to do that, from saying, when I gave my deposition, this was the story I told. Therefore, you ought to give the exact same story so that they won't be suspicious that both of us are lying. 
the what is, reason, the only reason I can see why these depositions aren't being made public is because the majority is going to be embarrassed that what they asked in depositions, they wouldn't have the nerve to ask people in a public hearing. And that shouldn't be a reason not to let the public Please. see, especially in light of the statements the chairman has given in the past, and we have it on the screen where Burton talked about, in this year, in April, the major purpose of a congressional investigation, as opposed, inferentially I put in, to a, uh, a, an independent counsel or, or prosecutor, our purpose is to illuminate the facts and not to hide them. Congressional investigations are by their very nature far different from a judicial inquiry where a grand jury conducts all matters secretly. Public disclosure of the facts is the essence and in large part of the purpose of congressional oversight. The American people have a right to know the facts in these matters. Reclaiming Quote my by Dan Burton. Yes, Reclaiming my time. The other point I would just like to say, and I thank the chairman for yielding to me, is that these transcripts were taken, these depositions, under oath. That is to say that if anyone were to change their story, uh, they would be subject to perjuring themselves before a congressional committee. So any suggestion that somehow this would give license to people to lie to Congress, I think is inappropriate. Gentleman yields, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Before I yield to uh, Mr. Davis, uh, uh, they referred to two of my quotations. You can put those back up on the screen, if you will. Uh, those quotations, uh, uh, it's been brought to my attention by staff, was at the end of the investigation when we were about ready to write our report and uh, you might, if you'll read that, it says, I really think we should have a vote on this and put them in the record. And in the second quote, it says, I urge a vote on this, a roll call vote. In both cases, the committee was going to vote on it. And if I had been voted down, it would not have been made a part of the record. And that's the, that's the policy we have now. So there's no, no inconsistency with what I said then and what we've said today. The fact of the matter is that was at the end of an investigation when we were writing our record, uh, writing our report, and we thought it was reasonable, or I thought it was reasonable, to put those depositions in the report because we had concluded the investigation. Mr. Davis. Well, yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you yielding. You yielding you uh, the, the investigation was Mr. not Chairman, concluded until September regular order, or October. Mr. Regular Mr. order, Mr. Mr. Chairman. August. Regular order. Mr. Davis. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you clarifying that because I think the point here is that these depositions will be released, and I hope they're released, at the end of the process. But if you do it in the middle of the process or at the beginning of the process, when you have different witnesses that have made conflicting statements, it really undermines the whole investigatory role where we have seen people uh, stonewall, stymie, and try to shut down this investigation in some of the witnesses that have been uh, uh, deposed to date. So I don't disagree at the end of this that we ought to let everything in the record and the public ought to know that. But it defeats the whole investigative purpose for those who have been involved in this before to do it at the beginning or in the middle. When people don't know what other witness, when one witness doesn't know what another witness has said back and forth. I think that's pretty clear. And I frankly think it's misleading to come out and say that we're too embarrassed about what's going to go on when you know full well that it is the intention of this committee at the end of this to release this and the public will have an opportunity well before the next election to see exactly what went on. And they can judge the investigation at that time. But it undermines the investigation to come on with this now. And what I keep hearing from the other from uh, some of the people that have been called as well. We didn't, we didn't do this, but we won't do it again, and trying to change the subject. We have a responsibility on this committee, unfortunately, uh, to try to find out exactly what happened. We can then perhaps uh, make laws after that, but the public, I think, has a right to know what happened. They're reading about it in the papers, and Congress has oversight responsibility. So it's entirely appropriate where we are and what we're doing, and I'm going to oppose the motion at this time, but if the motion is made to disclose these uh, at the end of the hearings, I'd be happy to support Gentlemen it. Gentlemen, I'll be happy to be on record at that time. Gentlemen, no, Gentlemen. For, let me uh, yield first to my friend from Florida, then to my friend from Massachusetts. Well, I thank the gentleman. I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed that uh, today uh, we we had a bipartisan effort to vote uh, uh, immunity for three witnesses, which are the result of of our uh, investigation to date. I think that every effort's been made on this side to make this, in fact, a bipartisan uh, investigation and effort. I heard just a moment ago one of the uh, one of the colleagues from the other side. Uh, refer to wild allegations that have been made from this side about the president and vice president. And I don't know that to be the case. What I find to be the case is every day I pick up the newspaper, 
picked up the New York Times a few days ago, and we ended up uh, over the past weekend uh, of the Attorney General asking uh, for an investigation to consider a special counsel. That wasn't uh, anything that uh, uh, that was done in a vicious manner from this side. I pick up the paper today, and uh, the headlines are DNC Teamsters Traded Funds. Uh, the scope of this, this whole uh, investigation is almost mind-boggling. That, in fact, uh, those, those depositions there uh, lead directly to this. There are 58 witnesses of which all of these folks have fled the country that, uh, that are in the top uh, tier here. Uh, over a dozen folks, uh, principals in this investigation, have fled the country. In addition to that, look at the list, 58, a total of 58 witnesses unavailable. Now, if you want to impede and shut down this investigation, then we can support what the minority uh, wants us to do here today. But if we want to go forward and, and conduct a thorough investigation, and I don't care where the chips fall. I don't care if uh, Republicans are, are, uh, get in trouble in this or Democrats get in trouble. It's our responsibility uh, to investigate this thoroughly and to, to do a good, fair job. And that's our only intent, and I'm disappointed at the actions, the charges of racism, the other, uh, the other diversionary tax tactics I see here today. Okay, thank you. Let me reclaim my time, then I want to get a chance to yield if I can. Uh, you know, if the gentleman would amend his motion and say that these would be released at the end of the hearing, uh, at the end of these hearings and be made part of the record, I would be happy to support that and perhaps in a bipartisan way uh, we could come together at that point and you would have the assurance that it's not out of embarrassment or anything else that these documents aren't being released and you would be assured they would be released at the gentlemen, end of time. You. Uh, the gentleman, I'd be you. Happy gentleman, you. Yeah, gentleman, be happy to, uh, well, let me ask the gentleman who's made the motion, would you be happy, would you be willing to amend that motion and allow these uh, to be released at the end of the hearings and be made part of the record at that point? And I think that would, should satisfy the gentleman. If the gentleman yield to me. I'd be happy to. Uh, first of all, uh, in the last go around, when we, which was the only time we used depositions, we did release the depositions in the middle of the investigation, not to the end. Secondly, over 50 people have been deposed. I don't think any of those people are going to ever be called before us as witnesses. And so I think we ought to make public those depositions, just as we did last time around in the middle of this investigation, and not try well, to... thank you. Let, let me reclaim my time because I want to yield. So the answer is you, you wouldn't be satisfied with what I propose at this point. That's I'll yield to my friend from... Thank you, Mr. And I wouldn't be satisfied with that because I think what we need here is to re close them now, disclose them right away. In the judicial system generally, and I know in my state, there's never any difficulty with having depositions disclosed when they're taken and all of the purported risk uh, that you seem to put forward uh, are still there. If people are going to testify to deposition one day and then change somebody else's testimony, they pick up the phone and call them, tell them what they told them, or give them the heads up on something. The fact of the matter is, it's not going to undermine any sort of process by releasing these. And the fact of the matter is, I'm afraid, having seen these depositions and knowing that very few of the members here have ever gone to them and participated, if they saw them, particularly if they have any kind of a background in this type of process, they'd be appalled. Uh, well, the way I think they were conducted in the, in the positive information, the lack of focus. Well, so I, let's let the public see what the millions of dollars that this committee has had to duplicate the Senate's efforts are really getting them. Yeah. And let them do it now because well, I frankly think it will be embarrassing. Thank you. I, I think my time's about up. Let me, let me just say you've had the right to be at the depositions to, uh, at that point, object to anything being said. I favor disclosure, but I think it would undermine the investigation to do it at this point, and we'd be happy to try to accommodate your request at a time when it won't undermine what we're trying to achieve here. Gentleman Yale. Time has expired. Chairman. Uh, gen the gentleman from uh, Illinois. I move the previous question. I understand, but there wasn't anybody that wanted to speak. I didn't see any hands go up. No, I, I, I just wanted to ask. Uh, I, I, just one second. Would the gentleman withdraw that? I, I I'd be happy to withdraw. I, I just want to ask the question. I think it would be tantalizing to me anyway if, if about uh, releasing this information at the end of the hearing if we could get a date certain when the end of the hearing is. Well, let me just respond as uh, chairman of the committee. Uh, we intend to conduct a very thorough investigation into all of the avenues that we are charged to explore, and I cannot give the gentleman a date certain at this time. And, and the DNC, I was just informed, has not given us an end date on production of documents we requested. 
Uh, is there further discussion on your side of the aisle? Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to make a comment. Gentleman's recognized. You know, besides reiterating the fact that release would not undermine uh, any of this investigation, and generally most of the judicial systems in this country act on that process, require, in fact, that depositions be filed with the court during the process of litigation and allow them to be uh, viewed by the public in, in general. Uh, that is the fact that of all the depositions taken, it's amazing to learn that the first witnesses called here are people that, in fact, weren't deposed until the very last minute. So I'm sure that whatever the other people had to offer was scintillating and exciting, so much so that it would be an embarrassment to disclose what it is they testified about and how far afield these interrogations went. Uh, I think that the, uh, this idea of it's bipartisanship when something on that side of the aisle wants to be done, but there's an absolute lack of cooperation when a very reasonable request is made on this side. I think the public should definitely know what's in those depositions, and uh, then I think we'll see you know, that they also want to know where their money's going and why this thing can't be focused and brought out to be a more nonpartisan type of operation. Thank you. All right. Gentlemen, yield back the balance of his time. Mr. Davis? Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? No, I'm going to yield to Mr. Davis and some of my time. Okay, the gentleman yields Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I simply want to associate myself with the remarks of those who have indicated early on, and all of us did, that we thought it was appropriate to grant immunity. But also, when we look at the point now, we're saying, let's share the information. And I hear excuse after excuse as to why we can't share this information with the public. Well, it seems to me that if something looks like a fish, if it swims like a fish, if it acts like a fish, then it's fishy. And so it seems to the public that it's fishy that we would generate this information and then not share it with the public so they can have the same information that we're dealing with. So I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I yield back time. Does the gentleman uh, yield back the balance? I would time? yield some time to Mr. Allen, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just have a couple of points to make. If, if this were the beginning of the investigation of this committee, or near the beginning of this investigation of this committee, it would seem to me this motion uh, would you'd have a valid argument against this motion. But we've been at this now for nine months. We've spent, I understand, two and a half million dollars. There have been 50 depositions taken. On the other side of, of the building, the Senate is concluding its investigations into these, uh, into these matters and turning its attention to legislative reform. It seems to me that given those circumstances, it really does make sense to put out what we found uh, so the public can understand what we're doing, let the light shine in, let the public understand uh, what's been going on so far. Therefore, I think we ought to support the motion. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Back the balance uh, of the time. I, I, I'm about to yield to Mr. Hastert, but before well, Mr. I Mr. Chairman, since so my time, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thanks. Before I do, let me just say uh, that uh, we didn't start depositions until about three months ago because we had difficulty in getting uh, cooperation for deposition authority. So we've really only had depositions being uh, undertaken for about three months. Mr. Haskin. Yeah, I yield uh, for a short statement, Mr. Cox. Uh, thank you. I, I hope by uh, way of summary, uh, so that we can move to the previous question, uh, I can just say that I agree with several of the comments that have been made, I think, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, about uh, the procedure that we ought to follow for the release of depositions. We ought to, in accordance with the traditions and customs of this committee, our regular practice and procedure, uh, make public upon the wish of any single member uh, any deposition or any portion of it uh, if that member chooses to do so uh, in the course of any public hearing, number one. Number two, uh, we ought to, as the chairman has pointed out and as members on the minority side have pointed out, uh, put it to a vote of the committee uh, whenever people think screens would be long running and uh, uh, I'm sure enthralling. But uh, it just seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that it's wrong. Uh, it, it sends the wrong message not to make these depositions public and particularly to show the progress of this committee. And I yield at this point to the gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos. I thank my friend for yielding, and I want to review the bidding, particularly in view of comments about bipartisanship on the other side. What has happened so far is that the chairman came to us 
with a request that we grant immunity to three witnesses, and with a unanimous vote, we did so. Every single Democratic member of this committee acceded to Mr. Burton's request for immunity. Now we have a second motion by the ranking member calling for the release of testimony depositions by witnesses. Common sense would suggest that if there are embarrassing and incriminating aspects to these depositions relating to democratic abuses in campaign finance, the Democrats on this committee would not be calling for the release of those depositions. The exact opposite is the case. We have nothing to fear from releasing those depositions. I believe, and I am happy to stand corrected, I spend more time in the depositions than any member of this committee on either side of the aisle. As a matter of fact, to the best of my knowledge, most members attended not a single deposition. Now, my attendance may be a sign of masochism, but what, whatever it is, I am convinced that the American people are entitled now to see these depositions. And I wonder what, what motivates the desire for secrecy on the part of some of our colleagues. We feel that these depositions will show the American people that the depositions were overwhelmingly a waste of taxpayers' money, revealed practically no, no new information, and were duplicative of the Senate efforts. We are asking for sunshine to be allowed to penetrate these hearings. And I earnestly hope that at least some of my colleagues on the other side will support this motion. The, the notion that there is this vast body of secret and incriminating information that came out in these depositions is a phony notion. There isn't a shred of evidence to it. And we dare you to let the American public decide what these depositions contain. I urge the approval of the motion. And the gentleman would yield, yield the if, gentleman. if Mr. Wise would yield for... Oh, I'd be happy, happy to yield. Happy to yield to the gentleman from Tennessee. Yeah, just very briefly, if I, if I might add, I would certainly associate myself with all of the comments that have been made by members who are urging making these uh, depositions public or included in the public record. And I would also remind the chairman that in light of how the credibility of this committee has certainly been strained. We see those throughout the American community questioning whether or not uh, those who are leading this committee's charge really have the credibility to uncover what they allege has happened. I would also remind the chairman and all on this committee that we are the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. And for us not to make these documents public, Mr. Chairman, is an affront not only to those of us on this committee, but is a slap in the face of Americans. We are the committee in this Congress uh, who's been charged with holding our Congress and holding our colleagues accountable. And to not make these documents public in light of the fact that uh, I welcome Mr. Bennett, our new counsel, in light of the fact what our former counsel said and several deputies in your office have said, in light of all, of all of the other charges and allegations that have been made that have proven to be valid in many ways, I would say let us get off to a new start on the eve of bringing in witnesses who, uh, I might add, we were bringing in witnesses that had not, that had not been deposed, um, more than 50 depositions, 200 hours. Let us get off to a fresh start. Let us get off on a fresh track, make the depositions public, adhere to your record, uh, and let us, for a change, uh, add some credibility and bring some credibility to this committee's uh, investigations. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? Yes. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I move the previous question. The previous the question has been moved. Mm -hmm. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the previous question is ordered. The question occurs now on the motion by Mr. Waxman. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. On that, can we have a roll call, Mr. Chairman?
A roll call has been requested and will be ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes no. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? No. Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? No. Mr. Cox votes no. Ms. Ross Layton? No. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? No. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis of Virginia? No. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? No. Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Souter? No. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Scarborough? No. Mr. Scarborough votes no. Mr. Shattuck? No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. LaTourette? No. Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Sanford? No. Mr. Sanford votes no. Mr. Sununu? No. Mr. Sununu votes no. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Sessions votes no. Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Pappas votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman vo votes no. Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Aye. Mr. Wise votes aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Condent? Mr. Condent votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Kucinich? Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Bogoyevich votes aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Ford votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Cummings? What is he proposing? Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 19 ayes and 23 nays. The motion is not agreed to. Uh, the chair will point out that there's a vote pending on the floor. When we return, we will recognize the vice chairman of the committee for a motion. Uh, the chair stands in recess till the conclusion of this vote. Please return as quickly as possible. Which one? Well, I got a message from
We'll return to the House Government Committee meeting on its campaign fundraising investigation in a moment. But first, some programming information. Capitol Hill security plans will be featured on this morning's Washington Journal. A Senate committee has proposed a $15 million plan to update security in and around the Capitol building. Senate Sergeant-at-Arms Gregory Casey helped develop that plan. He'll answer questions about it and take your calls during Washington Journal. That's this morning beginning at 7 Eastern Time on our companion network C-SPAN. Later this morning, the Census Bureau holds a news conference on income, poverty, and health insurance for the nation and the states. We'll hear from the Bureau's Chief of Housing and Household Economic Division. See live coverage beginning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We return now to the Rayburn House Office Building on Capitol Hill. In the center of your screen is the Chairman of the House Government Reform Committee, Representative Dan Burton. He's talking with Congressman Paul Kanjorski of Pennsylvania, one of the Democratic Committee members. In just a moment, the committee will resume its discussion of granting immunity to three witnesses in its campaign fundraising investigation. The committee will reconvene, and the gentleman, the vice chairman of the committee, uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Cox, is recognized for his to speak on his motion. A bit going of order, Mr. Chairman. The, the gentleman motion will state his point of order. order. Is he offering a motion at this time? The gentleman, I believe, is preparing to offer a motion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion at the desk. Mr. The chairman, I reserve a point of order on the motion. The gentleman uh, reserves a point of order on the motion. The clerk will report the motion. Mr. Cock moves the committee adopt the following procedures regarding the handling of deposition transcripts. Information obtained in depositions shall be made public to the extent Mr. used chairman? by members of the committee Mr. Chairman, and committee staff. Uh, I ask unanimous consent the motion be considered as read. It's been distributed to members. The gentleman asks unanimous consent that the motion be considered as read. Is there objection? No objection is heard. The gentleman is recognized on his motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, uh, we've had a lengthy, very lengthy discussion about the circumstances under which depositions uh, should be released in advance of a hearing. Under our committee rules, uh, depositions can be made public and routinely are made public uh, either in the course of a hearing or afterward. Uh, by vote of the committee, if not in the course of a hearing. Uh, it's the obvious interest of the minority to release depositions to the public uh, outside of hearings, uh, in addition to hearings, uh, prior to hearings, uh, and uh, that was the purpose of the defeated Waxman motion. Uh, as we discussed uh, this morning, and uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, there is no reason that uh, depositions ought not to be made public. It's the intention of the committee to make depositions public. Uh, they shall be made public. Even if the majority wished for some reason not to make them public, it would be the right not only of the minority collectively, but any individual minority member to make them public uh, in appropriate circumstances in a hearing. Uh, and uh, so what we're debating here is not whether to make depositions public, but simply under what circumstances. Uh, when we adopted our protocols, uh, we distinguished between uh, documents that contain confidential information, which we wanted to treat uh, very sensitively, and those that did not. Uh, in the motion that was offered by Mr. Waxman, there was no such distinction. Uh, and as a result, uh, even to the extent that we uh, were deposing uh, someone from the White House, uh, someone uh, from the national security apparatus, uh, someone involved uh, with our intelligence gathering, someone from overseas, uh, it wouldn't matter. Uh, we're going to treat all depositions as if they are the same. Uh, all of them uh, uh, immediately uh, would be made available to the public. That just doesn't make sense. A one-size-fits-all standard for anticipatorily releasing depositions does not make sense. But uh, I think we can come up with a compromise, and the compromise takes advantage of the document protocol that we've already adopted. Uh, we are making, uh, in the earlier Waxman motion, 
an artificial distinction between testimonial evidence and documentary evidence. Our document protocols cover documents, pieces of paper, where the words of a witness are written down, uh, and depositions uh, cover oral information given at a deposition, although ironically that ends up in a transcript and becomes documents itself. Uh, we ought to treat all this information because all of it ultimately comes from the same or similar sources in the same way. Uh, we have set up a working group comprised of both the majority and the minority, a small working group of five people uh, to determine the release publicly of documents. Uh, to make sure that we don't have leaks, but to make sure that we put out information uh, uh, wherever appropriate. Uh, I have discussed with the ranking member the utility of getting this group together and meeting uh, on a routine basis and taking advantage of that. Uh, I'd like to see us do that with respect to documents, and there's no reason in the world we can't do that with depositions as well. And so the motion that I have before the committee uh, would empower that five-person uh, working group already established under our document protocol uh, to determine the advisability of the release of depositions as well as documents. Uh, under the ruling of the parliamentarian of the House, it takes the whole committee to decide whether to release publicly information collected in executive session. And of course, these depositions are deemed to be taken in executive session. Uh, and so uh, we must have a determination by this full committee, but we have a big committee and it would be cumbersome and slow us down to always have to have the whole committee meet to make information public. We agreed upon that when we did the document protocol. And so uh, for the same reason, uh, we ought to try and expedite that procedure even though the parliamentarian has ruled that we need a full committee vote for the release of depositions. And that's what this motion does in addition. It says that uh, once the working group recommends that a deposition or part of it, uh, any part of it or all of it should be released, uh, then the chairman shall immediately poll all the members in writing and by written agreement uh, a bare majority of us uh, agreeing with the recommendation of the working group then instantly makes that deposition public. Uh, failing uh, a majority agreeing in writing, uh, the chairman is then advised to uh, hold a business meeting if people still want to press the issue within two weeks. Uh, or if there's, uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, nobody interested in making this public except a few people, the chairman could simply advise the uh, committee of the result. Uh, but by taking advantage of this uh, working group, uh, we can, I think, expedite the release of depositions in precisely the fashion that the, minor the minority desires. Uh, second, it's my understanding that uh, uh, members want additional staff to have access to these depositions. Uh, of course, Right now, any member can attend the depositions, and we've heard that many of the minority have done so, but it's very important uh, uh, that we be able to rely on staff. Committee staff are empowered, uh, in my motion, uh, to prepare written summaries, even of uh, confidential material for members to prepare us for these hearings. Both minority and majority are treated the same. Uh, but in addition, every member, minority and majority, can designate one of their personal staff, not committee staff, but one of their personal staff, also now for the first time to come down and look at these materials. The materials covered by our protocol, which no personal staff can presently look at, and the materials covered by uh, uh, the motion on depositions. Uh, as a result of that, uh, I think all of the members will find it uh, much easier to keep themselves informed because we are going through a lot of material. And I hope that this uh, will be uh, a fair compromise. Uh, my indication from uh, Mr. Waxman is that uh, he's insisting on his original motion, but uh, nonetheless, I hope you all recognize this does meet more than halfway the interest that uh, that motion advances, and for that reason, I offer it for your consideration and urge your vote. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Waxman. First of all, I, I, res I continue to reserve my point of order, but I do want to be recognized to uh, speak to this issue. Uh, I uh, thought the appropriate way to handle depositions is to make them public, and I offer that motion, which has been defeated. So we have uh, now a new alternative being offered by Mr. Cox, which I think is uh, out of order, and I'll speak to that if we get to that point. But I think it is also not a compromise. From the point of view of the minority, we would consider it a step backwards. There is an important distinction between confidential documents that are received by the committee 
Uh, in the past, the way all investigative committees handle these matters is that confidential information was not released to the public without uh, authorization by the chairman and the ranking minority or a vote of the committee. We objected to the delegation of that authority in the original protocols by which this committee operated uh, because it was a delegation that we thought was improper. It was a delegation that, that we thought was a bad idea. As sort of a palliative to us, it was suggested, well, why don't we get five members together to discuss this, and then those five members can make a recommendation to the chairman if they think that this information should not be made public. We have not convened that group of five. We have not had the instance yet of confidential information to be disclosed. But the depositions are not the same. The depositions are taken in executive session of the committee. The documents are not received in executive session. When depositions are taken in executive session, we are then guided by the House rules, which insist that disclosure has to be voted on by the committee itself. We attempted to have the committee vote to disclose these documents. We do not believe that it requires a hearing in which a document uh, can be disclosed. That wasn't our past practice. It's not in the rules. We think it's appropriate, uh, as was handled by Mr. Klinger last time, that documents uh, could be, that depositions could be made public by a vote of the committee at any time. We tried it. That the committee rejected it. Now, the Cox proposal goes beyond the, the, uh, the rules of the House and sets up another procedure of five people to talk to the chairman and then see what they might come up with and then, I guess, to make a recommendation to the full committee. That's one part of it. The other part of it goes to the issue of when uh, members from the minority uh, staff and the, both of the committee and of the personal staffs can communicate with each other about these depositions that are being taken in executive session. The way we see the Cox proposal, and maybe my colleague doesn't see it this way, but we see it as an attempt to keep the minority members of the committee in the dark. Uh, we think that uh, if you're interested in our cooperation, and we gave it to you on granting immunity, we're being rewarded by something that is a slap in the face and a step backwards. Now, maybe I'm incorrect in my reading of the Cox proposal, but that's the way I read it. It violates an express written understanding that we had with the chairman. We had an extensive discussion about how the minority staff can communicate with the members of the minority. We reached an understanding that the minority members of the committee can designate a staff member to review written summaries of depositions prepared by the minority staff. This was a matter of great importance to the minority. In fact, it was the, one of the only accommodations that were extended to the minority during the uh, full nine months we've had this investigation. And now it appears under the Cox proposal that we will have even this meager accommodation taken away from us. Uh, and I offer the letter of the chairman dated September 22 uh, as part of the record. And I hope there would be no objection to the chairman's letter being uh, part of this record. The chairman wrote to me on September 22 to codify the agreement that we reached, and the letter says uh, that we would have designated staff may receive written briefings from committee staff regarding depositions. We agree to this provision as an essential element of keeping minority members informed. We realize that if designated personal office staff couldn't review written materials prepared by the minority staff, there would be no effective way for minority members to stay informed. The Cox motion violates this understanding. It provides that, and I quote, written summaries may not be shared with members' personal staff. Complete opposite. It's a blatant effort to prevent the minority members from being efficiently informed about the investigation. It's another effort to silence our opposition, and it's flatly inconsistent with our prior understanding. Now, the gentleman from California said to me in private conversations, that he's trying to work out on a bipartisan basis some cooperative ways to proceed. I welcome that statement. We don't view this proposal as consistent with that statement. But I'd request 
before I assert my point of order, that the gentleman from California withdraw his proposal, that we have an opportunity to talk to him and see if perhaps we are, uh, there is a way to reach agreement or if we're talking past each other, and see if we can work something out, if he's willing to do that. If he's not willing to do it, well, I'll assert my point of order. If my point of order fails, we'll have the majority outvote us. But let me assure you, the majority outvoting us over and over and over again is not leading us to any kind of semblance on our side that you want to work with us. And furthermore, it gives us the distinct impression that what this committee's investigation is doing is something where you do not want to work with us because it's partisan and you want to pursue partisan and unfair procedures. Let me just give one example of what was rammed down our throat in the deposition authority, unlike what was done in the, under the Klinger Committee, where an hour deposition time would go to the majority and then an hour to the minority. That was wiped out. Our people sat through those depositions and then were allowed to ask questions after sitting for 10 hours. It's like this committee voting to say that if we have a hearing, the Republicans can ask all the questions until they're finished, and then if there's time left, the Democrats in the minority can ask these questions that they may have. We don't consider that a way to participate in this investigation. And if you say to us, well, you're not participating in the investigation, I can say only back to you, we are not participating because we are being forced not to by the majority. So my first request to the gentleman from California is to withdraw his amendment to discuss it further. If not, then I will assert my point of order. And I'll yield to the gentleman from California, which I think is appropriate to do when you speak of a colleague. I thank the gentleman and I thank him. Uh, as uh, we discussed uh, in a sidebar, since we both live in Southern California, I hope we take every opportunity uh, at home as well as here uh, to work together and work out uh, accommodation for members on both sides. Uh, I think it's important for us to move forward and get some procedure in place uh, uh, for the release of depositions as opposed to none. And, and I think everybody would have to recognize that if we don't adopt my motion, we have no procedure at all. Uh, and uh, it would require a full committee vote to release uh, any deposition, so we would in fact be in worse shape. And with respect to uh, uh, personal staff, uh, my motion permits personal staff to be designated uh, by any minority member and every minority member, any majority member and every majority member treated equally, and all of us have access to this to the extent that the committee is preparing information uh, for us, uh, that, and that's uh, both minority and majority committee, uh, that covers uh, executive session material. If I, if I can just that interrupt you for a minute. That is material that's supposed to be secret. I just want to point out that the restriction on sharing it with anyone but members applies equally to the majority and the minority. That's a restriction okay. we're placing on ourselves, too. If, if the gentleman would be in, I don't want to interrupt you, but the, you say there'd be no procedures. The procedures that will be in effect will be the procedures that the chairman has set out in a letter to us. You may not like what the chairman agreed to, but the chairman agreed to it. And now if you want to overturn what the chairman agreed to, and if he supports it, then uh, you can imagine how we would feel about the matter. Would the gentleman yield further? Certainly. Uh, what the chairman wrote to you, and I saw a copy of this letter, as did other members of the committee for the first time last night, was that the parliamentarian's office advises that in order for these procedures to take effect, this agreement should be ratified by this committee with unanimous consent. So I would think that we'd get a chance to talk about it and discuss it and so on. Uh, and and uh, it is not uh, possible for the ranking minority member to impose this on an unwilling committee. Uh, rather, according to the parliamentarian, it would have taken unanimous consent or failing that, then we would put it to a vote of the committee. And your motion was defeated. Uh, I'm offering uh, a motion that I think gives more than half of what you're asking for. I think it gives 99% of what you're asking for. And, and I do believe that if we're going to work cooperatively, we have to do two things. One is we have to keep some amount of focus, even on the minority side, on the law breaking that we're supposed to be investigating. And as I said in our sidebar, I haven't seen any of that from anybody on the minority today. Second, we need to make sure we don't simply oppose for opposition's sake. We ought to be working together. If a gentleman would permit, the letter says uh, from the chairman, the parliamentarian's office advises that these procedures may be instituted upon agreement between the chairman and the ranking minority member. They have advised that this agreement should be ratified by the committee with the unanimous consent agreement at the next committee business meeting. Precisely. I, I think the chairman has reached an agreement with us. We applaud that. We appreciate it. It's one of the few times we've had an agreement with the minority. Your amendment overturns it. 
Uh, we object to that. Would the gentleman uh, yield? The gentleman yield? I, I'd be pleased to. Uh, and I'm going to assert my point of order. Uh, I don't know how the chairman wants to proceed, but uh, I well, do have a point of order. The gentleman, the gentleman from Orange County is suggesting that because you worked out an agreement with the chairman, that somehow you're ramrodding this through the committee, and that just doesn't add up to me. We have a letter from the chairman laying out an agreed procedure. Um, and it would seem to me that, that uh, there's no way in shape and form could you be, as the ranking member, uh, trying to assert this a uh, carte blanche on the committee. This is something that's been worked out between the two of them. So I, I think you've misspoken um, on that, and it, it suggests something that is not, not in front of us. No, Mr. Chairman, I continue to reserve my point of order, which you recognize at the appropriate time to the assert The gentleman reserves gentleman his point of order. Uh, Mr. Further discussion? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Kinjors, or the, we'll go in the, senior, oh. in the order of seniority. Uh, yeah, Mr. Lant uh, Mr. Lantos, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to inquire of my friend from California whether I read his uh, motion correctly. Because if I do, I'm afraid we are dealing with the theater of the absurd here. Earlier, this committee voted down our motion to make all depositions public. You are proposing a substitute which you suggest goes 99% of the way towards meeting our proposal. Let me read point one of your proposal, if I may. This is the opening paragraph. Information obtained in depositions shall be made public to the extent used by members of the committee and committee staff in public hearings in which that information is pertinent to the subject matter of the hearing. Now, if I read this, read this correctly, and if I understand English, and I have the benefit of not being an attorney, so I have to use common sense in understanding these uh, uh, complicated resolutions. We, are, we really have sort of three hypothetical situations, don't we, Mr. Cox? Number one, all of the depositions will be used in public hearings. None of the depositions will be used in public hearings, or some of them will be used in public hearings. It was my contention as the member of the committee who has spent more time in these depositions than any other member is that the overwhelming bulk of these depositions are worthless. They are, they are not very high level fishing expeditions looking for dirt and not finding it. Therefore, if in fact the bulk of these depositions will not be used in public hearings, the bulk of these depositions will never see the light of day. Our motion, which you defeated, had as its purpose to make available to the American people all of the depositions, period. We made that motion because it is our view that the American people are entitled to know what this committee does. With in the German secret, deal? not at this point when I'm finished, I will. In secret, behind closed doors. What your quote unquote compromise offer indicates that if in fact the bulk of the depositions are worthless, which is my position, I can only speak for myself, they are not worth the paper they are written on, and they are certainly not worth the millions of dollars of taxpayers' money that the majority spent on them. The bulk of these depositions will never be used in a public hearing. Ergo, they will never be made public. Now, I know why this motion is offered, Mr. Chairman. The Republicans are embarrassed for having voted down a sunshine motion. You had an opportunity to say yes. You had an opportunity to agree with us that the American people should look at these depositions. For reasons of your own, you chose not to do this. And you are now looking for a lifesaver. You are now looking for a formula, and this is not a particularly good formula, 
that can put you on the side of the American people by saying, well, you voted under some circumstances to make some depositions public. But you set the bar very high, Mr. Cox. What you are saying, and I'm quoting you again, information obtained in depositions shall be made public to the extent used by members of the committee and committee staff in public hearings. If my assumption is correct, and I prepared to make a private bet with you that it will be proven to be correct, that the bulk of these depositions will never be used in a public hearing, because there is nothing in these depositions. There is nothing in, in these depositions. So you will not, not bring them forward. You will not bring them forward. Then they will forever remain secret. And uh, that clearly is uh, not what we were trying to do. We were trying to give to the American people every last deposition in total. I am happy to yield to you. Let me just say it is the intent of the chair at the conclusion of the investigations that we're going to conduct to make all depositions public. And uh, that was the intention of the Klinger Committee, and I think that was done as well. So while we're talking about not making them public at the present time, that does not mean that uh, they, will not be, they will be kept from the public because it's the full intent of, of the chair to make sure that they will be made public at the conclusion of our investigation. Well, the, the chair, if I may reclaim my time, the chair's statement is diametrically opposed to the proposal of Mr. Cox because Mr. Cox says that information obtained in depositions shall be made public to the extent used by members of the committee and committee staff in public hearings. Would the gentleman I you just, uh, if I may finish, what, what the chairman just said, that it is his intention to make all depositions public at the conclusion of the hearings. That statement is diametrically opposed to the Cox Amendment. I also would add that while it is an improvement over the Cox Amendment, it is self-evident that public interest in these hearings, which is not at a very high level now, will be zero once these hearings are concluded. Would so to make them, I just want to finish my sentence. So to make them public when this whole game is over is of no pragmatic value to anybody. If the gentleman yield, I'll uh, be happy to yield. I, I want to make sure it's, it's clear what I just said. Uh, it's the intent of the chair to do that, but I anticipate that uh, there would be a vote of the committee, and the committee would probably unanimously at that time vote to, uh, to make all of those public. Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized? I'm happy to yield to my friend from California. Mm. Well, if the gentleman's I time has time. expired. Is there anybody on this side that uh, seeks time? gentleman is uh, recognized. I would yield to gentleman yields to Mr. Cox. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was hoping to uh, uh, respond since the gentleman had indicated he was prepared to yield. Uh, uh, my good friend from California modestly says that he's not a lawyer. Uh, and proudly, uh, proudly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but he does uh, uh, show one notable lawyer skill and that's the ability to argue both sides of the same question. At once he's telling us that there's absolutely nothing of interest in these depositions. It's all useless information and poppycock. And on the other hand he's telling us that this information is absolutely vital to the American people's right to know and must be released willy-nilly. The truth is that neither is the case and the gentleman knows that full well. Second, the gentleman employed I think uh, by inadvertence uh, uh, what otherwise would be uh, a lawyer's device of reading only a portion of a document. Uh, the motion that I have before the committee has seven numbered paragraphs and the gentleman read only the first paragraph. The first paragraph uh, states what is our procedure here for the conduct of public hearings. You can release depositions to the public as an individual minority member uh, without full vote of the committee without consent of the chairman or anyone else in the course of a public hearing and which are released is up to you. Uh, if you don't uh, use them in the hearing, well then you're right. Uh, they won't be released, but it's up to you if you'd like to use them and release them for that purpose. And of course, if there's nothing in here of interest to the American people at all, I suppose it doesn't much matter. Uh, but as, as I pointed out, I disagree with that. Uh, but the rest of my motion offers an additional 
an alternative procedure for the release of depositions, which is not available under our committee rules and not available under House rules, and will facilitate it. And that is the five-person uh, working group that uh, can meet uh, at any time uh, and agree upon the release of these documents. And I, I hope that the gentleman from California uh, would read the rest of the motion because that's the essence of it. Uh, we will have an opportunity to consider these things on their merits and we, off, we, we, we absolutely ought to because uh, sometimes these depositions, as the gentleman knows when he was in the majority and chaired investigations, you know, sometimes when you're investigating the executive branch you come across material uh, that ought not to be released uh, willy-nilly. Uh, we ought to discriminate between information that should be publicly released forthwith and that which would injure the reputations of the people involved, that which would uh, disclose uh, national security information and so on. But in the motion that we had before us earlier, as I discussed, there was absolutely no distinction made between what's confidential and what's not. All would be released. And uh, so this procedure, uh, which does the very best job that we can to get the depositions out without having to convene all of us together for a business meeting like this, and we can see how long it takes to do this, well, the gentleman is the best way I know of to get that information out. I'd be happy to yield to my friend. Mr. Cox, I, I, I wanted to go back to some of the basics. Would you agree that a deposition is something that would normally be taken in the full hearing here would be part of the open record and the only reason it isn't is we're trying to save time and be more efficient or is there something that's happening at these depositions that would not be allowed at a public hearing? Now no, I've attended most of the depositions and the only thing I find about the deposition is they're tedious, poorly thought out, sometimes take eight or ten hours when you would never publicly take a high official of the United States government and tie it up for an entire day asking sometimes ridiculous questions over and over and over again. But I would think that there are several elements here to look at. One, what constitutes an executive session? You redefine and put this in executive session. Now I've been at these depositions. There are no members of the elected Congress there. Now how is an executive session of this committee occurring when there aren't any, there are chairmen's not there, the ranking members aren't there, and no members of Congress are there, only secondary staff are there. That, I don't constitute that as an executive session myself. I, I think they are depositions, but they're not an executive session. Secondly, my question is, who owns these depositions? If, if the, uh, the chief of staff of the president comes up here and is required to testify for eight hours to nonsense, and clears his reputation by straight denials, why shouldn't he be entitled to the American public and the press to know that? Well, reclaiming what my time, I'd be pleased that? to answer your questions. Uh, in the case of a deposition that was mere tedium, I don't think there'd be any principled objection to releasing that. Oh, no, public, no, no, no. Which no, is what we ought to do. But in no, the case of a deposition, no, Harold I mean, Ickes, for example, uh, is at the center of this. If we take Harold Ickes' deposition, he's the Deputy Chief of Staff of the President of the United States at the Times, covered by his deposition testimony, there is surely going to be some risk that... Uh, risk do I? Risk that, that some plot reclaiming, on you? Reclaiming my time. Uh, risk that some of the things that he is called upon to discuss under oath in such a deposition uh, might involve the national security of the United States. If we ask him about sensitive matters relating to the People's Republic of China, you want to put all that stuff out no matter what? If we ask about information that might involve uh, intelligence uh, uh, sources uh, and methods and so on, do you want to put all that out? If the gentleman will yield... So, and I'm, this is not yield? a real example, I hasten right. to add. I'm well, not uh, if the, if the gentleman will yield, to the public, but, he has uh, an attorney there to if, make if the If the gentleman would permit me to, to uh, finish answering his question, uh, we need to distinguish between that which ought to be treated confidentially, that is one example, there could be many, uh, including the protection of reputations of innocent people, uh, all of whom I think we care about here, the innocent people, uh, I, uh, and the gentleman uh, those things which are mere tedium and ought to be put out. And finally, on the, the other point that you raised on you know, sitting through a deposition for a non-lawyer can be quite boring, uh, no kidding. Uh, you know, some people here have had their depositions taken in a civil proceeding. Uh, it starts out with the lawyer saying, state your name. Uh, you know, where were you born? What's your birth date? There's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in a deposition that by all means ought not to occur in this room, that by all means would be con considered irrelevant to the American people. That's the way lawyers conduct depositions. But that's also why we have the staff do that preparatory work before we bring it here to a full committee well, meeting. And to the extent that during 
a hearing of this committee, it's relevant. It'll get released. You can release it even if I don't want to. Uh, and to the extent that we don't cover it in the hearing, which was Mr. Lantos' yeah, Mr. Uh, Cox. example that he was worried about, you know, get our group to release it outside the hearings. That's a fine idea it, as well. But I just want to make sure we actually consider what we're doing so that the American people know we're conducting this investigation right. responsibly. I yield to you. Even in a court of law, a deposition isn't sealed unless one of the parties makes that request and puts a legitimate reason on the record. Here you're making the assumption that all depositions are in executive session and sealed and not open to the press or the public, like there's a star chamber proceeding. Well, reclaiming my time, that's because we're investigating violations of law here. We're investigating crimes. And no, as we're you know, if there's an independent counsel appointed, all of the independent counsel's information that's gathered will be kept secret. We, on the other hand, plan to make it public, but we want to do so responsibly, and we don't want to violate the rights of any make individual order, American. Mr. Gentleman's time has well, expired. Well, the general, uh, I ask you for my time, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Yes, I do. Mr. Ken Jorsky. All right. Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's because the committee is backed into this and, and for a long time has not established a protocol of how to operation, uh, operate that we see ourselves in this problem today. Ourselves in this problem today. Uh, uh, first and foremost, depositions, in my estimation, are something that are taken to facilitate speed efficiency of a trial or an inquiry. Obviously, nothing would be asked or, or demanded of these witnesses in, in a deposition that wouldn't be asked or demanded of these witnesses in an open trial, because if it is, their counsel or themselves would have a right to object and to refuse to answer or accept under certain conditions of confidentiality or otherwise for protection. All of these people that are being called before uh, uh, the committee staff for depositions are readily coming. I have sat through probably 30, maybe 20 or 30 hours of these depositions. I have yet to hear one of their lawyers object to anything being asked or asking or, or considering anything be confidential. There's nothing bad. These are, these are very responsible public officials that are a bit annoyed that there is an awful lot of uh, comment and rumor in the public that something is being done when they're coming up and clearing their name with factual information and their testimony under sworn oath. Now, if you're really seeking truth, and these people are giving their testimony under oath, put it out in the public. If they're lying, somebody's going to read about it in the paper and come in and tell us that they're violating the law or they're not following their oath. But what we're doing here is treating this as a secret informational source for purposes of how we can protect the public relations spin of how this happened. That's what this is all about. Rather than thinking of the individual lives that we're affecting, I know if I were Matt McClarty, if I were Bruce Lindsay, if I were any of these people who've called before this committee, I'd want the American press and the American people to see my six or eight hours of testimony when I clearly testified that I did nothing wrong, when I answered every imaginable question that could be put to me, but they'll never have that opportunity. It seems under this process, unless it's open to use in public hearing, anything that comes to the majority of this committee they don't like, they're going to be able to seal by a majority vote of the committee, and it will never get out to the public what was said or done. I've never, I, I can't imagine a, a court process being that narrow. I can't imagine why a, an oversight and an information hearing that's being held by the Congress for the purposes of not indictment, not for trial, but to legislate, to examine oversight and reform of the, of the House the and then of the government. Yes, I certainly won't. The points you're making are absolutely uh, correct in terms of getting the information out about these depositions. They ought to be made public. The chairman has told us he plans to make them public, he says, at some point at the end of the investigation. But I have to point out something else to, to you and to Mr. Cox. As the minority leader, I've talked to the chairman about a process by which the staffs would be involved in these depositions. And we reached an agreement. And the chairman sent me a letter memorializing that agreement, dated September 22. And he signed his name. This is the way we're going to proceed. It's the way we discussed it. It's the way we agreed to. Now we have before us a Cox proposal that overturns the chairman's agreement with us. Mr. Cox, you say you want us to all work on a bipartisan basis. 
how should we ever want to work with the, or feel we can work with the chairman if his decision is overturned two days later by the, the members of his caucus? That's, that is, seems to me the most outrageous thing, that the chairman's word would mean nothing. Why should we ever talk to him? Why should we ever talk to staff? Why should we ever hope to cooperate? Even though we started off today's meeting with an attempt for us to give you the votes on a bipartisan cooperative basis to give witnesses immunity. I, I, um, uh, I made the request I'll, I'll yield back. I just want to Mr. make that Chairman. point. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I make a point, Mr. Cox, in paragraph five. It's interesting. You're not even allowed to take notes. Who owns these statements? You mean, why can't we just ask on the record when you're examining one of these witnesses, do you have any reason that you do not want this deposition made public? And if the maker of the deposition says they have no objection to being made public, why can't it be public right at that moment? But what you're, what you're writing in this rule is if I sat through those hearings, I can't even use those notes now. I have a gag rule on me. I may have heard something in there that the summary of the committee staff hasn't returned to me. Maybe somebody hasn't picked the fact up, but I'm going to be denied the use of my personal notes or my staff's personal notes after seeing through hours and hours of hearings? That is ludicrous. I, I, I would re I'd revisit the question, who owns these depositions? Aren't these depositions the deposition of the person who's taken the oath and given the testimony? If they're not the possession of the majority of this committee. They're not the possession of the star chamber of the House of Representatives. They are sworn testimony of honest American citizens. That should be the presumption that are willing to swear that in public or in deposition form. And they do it in deposition form not to prevent public exposure, but to, be, but to help with the efficiency and effectiveness of the House. I, 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 I think we should work out an accommodation, but the presumption should be, it seems to me, that all depositions are public unless counsel for the uh, 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 deposed individual asserts some reasons they do not want them to be made public or, or the staff officials taking the desep, uh, depositions feel it has some effect on national security Mr. otherwise. Chairman. Other than that, it's, it should be free material to this committee, to the press, and to the American public. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Mr. I call a question. Chairman, beg your pardon? Mr. Chairman. Well, who does I call a question. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I wish to be heard. I be Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shays is recognized. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I feel like I've heard the arguments on both sides of the argument, and they come from the other side. Because earlier on, uh, a few months ago, we needed to make sure we protected the information that this committee had. And now we're hearing that we should allow staff and members to be able to take uh, information uh, that is really taken in what is under the rules of the House in executive session and take them out uh, in vast numbers uh, uh, and every member here would be allowed to do it. I think uh, really what you end up with is the same kind of problem we've ended up with the Thompson hearings with a lot of leaks which is what I thought you all argued against early on. The gentleman yield? No, I won't yield yet. I'd like to make a point. I'd like to make a point. And, when uh, you've made the point, perhaps you'll yield. I, I'd, I'd like to just make the point that when we had the argument last time and the, the, those on the other side of the aisle argued profusely that we had to be concerned with the, with the witnesses, we had to protect the sensitive material, and so on and so on, I went to some of the staff on our side and I said, if you leak any material, I will personally go to the chairman and ask that you be fired. And a, a while ago it was there were potential for leaks. Now there are no leaks. And we have uh, in play, if Mr. Waxman were to have his way, an opportunity for leak after leak after leak. With all due respect, when our chairman told us that he had agreed to bring this before the committee, I said, and some others said, we think you're wrong. We opposed it. He argued against our position. We frankly disagree with him. Now, we do have disagreements on our own side about things. I happen to think that these, these hearings ultimately should lead to campaign finance reform. My chairman may take a different view. So we have different views on this committee just like you have on that side. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to protect the witnesses. I'm going to vote for the Cox <coughs> Amendment. I'm going to make sure to the best of my ability there aren't any leaks and that when witnesses come before us, the, both sides will be able to bring forward the pertinent information that relates to their testimony and disclose it. 
And, uh, and if there are other requests to petition out more information, we have set up a body that Mr. Waxman argued for, and we did. So I would just say that um, um, my chairman can be right on many cases. In this case, uh, he agreed that he would bring it before the committee. He did. Uh, I hope that uh, his way does not succeed, your way does not succeed, and that Mr. Cox's amendment passes. and I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Micah. I'd just like to reiterate, too, the other side doesn't understand what's happened here. Uh, we read, in fact, uh, the letter that was agreed to. Uh, you need to speak. We, we read, in fact, the letter that was agreed to. And if you read the letter, it says it requires unanimous consent. And you must understand that to every man and woman on this side, we uh, disagreed and would not grant that unanimous consent. So that's the way uh, this side is going to operate. We, we tried to reach an accommodation, Mr. Shays uh, and uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, Cox has tried to craft something that would accommodate some of your concerns. We tried to work with you on the protocol. Now, if you don't work with us on this, uh, you are setting a bad precedent. Because I'm telling you, to a man and a woman on this side, we agreed to disagree and try to accommodate you. And we think this is a fair accommodation. And again, uh, we're trying to work in a cooperative effort. If this is in fact undermined, uh, you will not get that cooperation. Would the gentleman yield to me? We will indeed dig our heels in, and you have lost the support from this side uh, for our uh, reclaiming my time. Will, will the gentleman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, my time. Chairman. reclaiming my time, Mr. Cox, I yield to. Uh, I, I thank you, and and I think we're sort of walking around this many, many times. Uh, it's been stated. I think my colleague, Mr. Shays, in fact, uh, made the point. It's been stated over and over that depositions, not under the rules of this committee, but under the rules of the House our executive session material. And so if we do nothing, if we don't pass my motion, then there's no way except to convene a business meeting of this committee but to release anything from a deposition. On the other hand, if we pass my motion, then all of the points that are laid out in the agreement uh, between the uh, ranking member and the chairman for what would be proposed to this committee, and that's what the agreement was, to propose something to this committee. I mean, we're members too. Uh, this is a democracy. Uh, the parliamentarian ruled that it would take a majority vote of this committee. Uh, uh, all of those things essentially are incorporated in my motion. Uh, well, the gentleman we yield. Do, what chairman. we don't do, however, is let people walk out of here with the depots. You can't carry them out of here. Right. Uh, you know, otherwise, a, a member could check out the depot. We wouldn't see it for two days. Any other member who wants to see it wouldn't have access to it. Uh, and frankly, while I have uh, great trust in every single one of the members who's here today on both sides of the aisle, uh, when I worked in the White House Counsel's Office, we used to think if we sent stuff up to Capitol Hill, you know, good night, you might as well put it in the newspaper. And I hope that we can maintain a reputation on this committee, Democrats and Republicans, that we can be trusted with confidential information, that when information is received by this committee in executive session under the rules of the House that we treat it as such. And so if we pass my motion, we will have an expedited way for making this information public in a responsible way. If we defeat my motion, then according to the rules of the House and the parliamentarian, there will be no way to make these depositions public except to convene one of these meetings and discuss every single one of them ad nauseum, which I think is inappropriate. Mr. 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 Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman's Mr. time Chairman. has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Let's see, we'll go in the order of seniority. Gentleman from Connecticut? Wisconsin. Wisconsin, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Connecticut's not a bad state. So um, what I'd like to do is, is take a minute and, as my high school English teacher used to say, anchor, anchor yourself firmly in the text and, and look at paragraph two, because I don't know exactly what the intent is of Mr. Cox, but as I read paragraph number two, what it effectively does is makes sure that there will never be a vote on the release of a deposition unless the majority party wants a vote on the release of the deposition. And I base that on a number of different factors. In order to get a vote, there, there are several steps in this process. The key to the process is the recommendation of the document protocol working group. 
if a majority of the document protocol working group recommend that there be a release of the documents, immediately following that recommendation, you, Mr. Chairman, would poll the members. And presumably, since, since the majority controls the document protocol group, um, the members would follow that lead and would vote to release it. Let's say that, that the document protocol working group does not recommend the release of the documents. Let's say that it's a three to two vote. Hardly unlikely that that would happen with the three Republicans voting no and the two Democrats voting yes. What then is the mechanism for the Democrats to bring that into public view so that we can scrutinize that? If you look at this mechanism, there is no way to do it because further down, you do allow for any two members of the document protocol working group to request a business meeting, but they can only do so if the written poll does not yield a majority. And, and you're never going to have that situation because you're never going to poll unless a majority wants to poll. So you have a very clever mechanism here to make sure that the Democrats are never ever going to get a chance to discuss this like we're discussing this right now. Again, let me point this out. You've got the mechanism. There has to be an affirmative vote of the document protocol working group in order to get a written poll of the members. If you do not have that, you don't even get a written poll of the members. So that, that sentence, in, if the written poll does not yield a majority, you'll never have that. You will never have that situation. Would the gentleman yield I'd for a point of clarification? Uh, there's nothing in here that takes away any right you have to call a hearing on any subject. This simply adds to the rights you already have. Gentlemen, yield to me. Uh, if I could just, let me just finish. We have no right to call a hearing. We have no right to call a meeting. We have no right to even work out an agreement with the chairman if he won't stand by it. And that, and he's, the chairman is being told that what he agreed to with us, his Republicans won't go along with. So who are we supposed to cooperate with? If not the chairman, with whom? With Mr. Micah? With Mr. Micah and Mr. Cox? With Mr. Shays? With which one? Do we deal with each one of you separately? Or do you have a chairman who can talk to us and agree on procedures and then stand by them? I have not been personal in my discussions with you, about you, Mr. Chairman, but you have made an agreement on behalf of the majority of this committee for fair processes, and I expect you to stand by that agreement. Thank Re you reclaiming your... my time. And I'm, I'm going to assume that Mr. Cox is, is acting in good faith here. But the, uh, the killer, the killer in this, in this amendment is also the final sentence. In the alternative, the chairman may report the results back to the members of the committee. In other words, as Mr. Cox characterized it, if you had just a couple of people who wanted to have a poll, but what if those couple of people happened to be Mr. Waxman and Mr. Lantos, and they were the two that were pressing for it? Again, there is no mechanism in this paragraph that will allow the minority members to force a public discussion on the release of documents. So if the intent of the majority today is to ensure that we will never again go through this discussion and that the Democrats will never again parade out those, those lists of depositions, you're extremely successful. And I, I don't think that that's what the American people want. I don't know if this is poorly drafted. I don't know if this is just intended to be clever and that we're not going to understand what it means. But again, Mr. Cox, I would ask you, tell me the mechanism in this paragraph that would allow the two Democrats to call a meeting or even to call a vote if, if the document protocol working group doesn't side with them. Well, if you'll yield as you have, uh, I think the ranking member will tell you that I have sat down with him on the floor of the House and actually urged him to get interested in our five-person working group. Uh, all he needs to do is ask, and he has never asked for the no, no, that's of a not single my question. Deposition. My question is the language in this paragraph. Tell me where the two Democratic members of that working group have a right, because they will never get a chance to ask for that business meeting unless there's a written poll. Uh, and I there think, will not be a written poll unless a majority asks for a written poll. I, I think you know, the gentleman has not served sufficiently long in the capacity. I think I've I served, served very sufficiently long. I appreciate your kind for, of for six years. matter. But I well, want to know the minority, the sir, is. in the minority, because the majority rules. And we're operating on the rules that we've always had in the Congress where the hearing topic. Reclaiming my time. You're majority. drawing up new rules here. No, no. And so no. I'm asking in this, in this paragraph, Again, I'll ask you again, in this paragraph, where is the right 
of the Democrats there is no to right. have a public discussion. There is no right ever of the minority to trump the majority. And this is under a sham. This rules, is a sham, and that's what we should Under our it. existing rules or under anything that, that uh, we've been discussing here today. That's fine. Yeah, but uh, what does happen is we have a way the, to the discuss it. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the who seeks time? Mr. Anyone Chairman. on the majority? Chairman. Side? Chairman. What's that? Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Micah, we'll go to you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, uh, I think uh, our side has tried to be fair. I think if you look at the letter, uh, and I'm not an attorney, the letter clearly says that uh, the parlamenta parlamentarian's office advises us that these procedures may be instituted upon agreement by the chairman and the ranking minority member. They have advised this agreement should be, not may be, but should be ratified. I'm not, again, an attorney. If may is discretionary, should be ratified by the committee with a unanimous consent agreement at the next uh, committee business meeting. And that's the purpose of this meeting. And the purpose of, of the meeting was to consider whether we accept the uh, proposal by the majority uh, to release all uh, depositions to date. We voted uh, that down. But we voted it down uh, for good reason, because we do not feel that there should be this blanket uh, distribution at this time of the work of the subcommittee. That if, in fact, uh, we want additional uh, individuals to be deposed and also to testify before this committee, uh, that we do not want interference uh, in that process, and we are also willing uh, to make these depositions available uh, either uh, prior to their, immediately prior to their testimony or concurrent. Some of us would agree with that. Some of us uh, uh, have also said today that we would agree for a release of all uh, depositions, as has been the uh, custom in the, and practice in the past. So uh, I feel that uh, we have tried to uh, substitute for Mr. Waxman's proposal, a proposal that says in certain circumstances, depositions uh, with the permission of, uh, uh, of uh, the committee uh, can be released uh, in a proper and orderly manner so we can conduct a fair and independent uh, hearing. And uh, that is the, uh, the spirit and the letter in which we're trying to work with the minority to make this uh, a bipartisan, uh, a fair and open hearing. Uh, Mr. Cox has worked on this uh, issue. We also tried to accommodate the uh, minority in the protocol matter. I heard from the other side that, and, and I can't remember who said it, we'll look up the quote, but lives would be ruined if documents uh, were released. Well, we have the same concern here today uh, that lives could be ruined, reputations could be destroyed by release of this. We also don't need the, uh, the, uh, the possibility of a... Uh, deposition being released at this time prior to people being called before this committee or the long list of witnesses uh, who are we are trying to depose who are we tr who are we are trying to get to uh, testify again we've had over a dozen flee the country we've had 58 that have taken the uh, fifth amendment or will not participate so this isn't a game uh, to try to uh, release some of the information at this point and try to make it look as if there's nothing uh, there or uh, give uh, witnesses an opportunity to uh, get their verbal uh, and uh, testimony acts together. This is a serious effort on our part to try to be bipartisan, to look for a substitute to what Mr. Waxman proposed today, to release where we can with a mutual agreement, uh, depositions uh, uh, that we don't see that there's a conflict with, uh, uh, with releasing. So well, the yeah, there's precedent for this. I think there's fairness in what has been proposed, and I would strongly recommend uh, that we uh, that we adopt this substitute by Mr. Cox today and get on with the business that the people expect us to look 
at this unprecedented scandal in the history of campaign financing in, in this country and, Gentlemen, yeah. and whether it whether this touches upon Democrats or upon Republicans, it's our responsibility to properly investigate it, to move forward with the investigation, uh, and not to uh, impede the uh, invest investigation. And I really resent the, this blurring uh, of the issues, that everybody does it, that w there's unfairness in the process, that it's a partisan uh, effort. It is not. This chairman has uh, been as fair as any chairman and has tried to work with the other side every single step of the way. And there are members on this side who are prepared uh, not only today, but uh, have throughout this entire process tried to accommodate the minority because we have been in the minority uh, Will the uh, position yield? and we have had our rights and our opportunity to participate abused. And we don't want to see that Will happen the to you. So we ask you, I personally ask you to try to cooperate, to try to find a solution. And if the solution Neil? we pass today is not ade adequate uh, or acceptable, contact us and we will work with you and try to make certain We're that it's instituted you now. something that uh, meets We're letting uh, you know you know now. your needs. It's I not a bipartisan cooperation. Well, there's cooperation Mr. for you. The committee will be in order. Mr. Chairman. The, the gentleman has yielded back the balance of his time. We have a series of votes uh, pending on the floor of the House. Uh, we could take one more uh, statement if you choose, uh, but uh, there will not be a vote until uh, until after uh, after we uh, come back from the floor of the House. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, my, my gentleman is recognized for five minutes. My part will be uh, brief. I know the letter that you sent to Mr. Waxman on the 22nd. Um, had been negotiated for several weeks and you worked real hard to try to come up with an agreement. Um, I, I would just ask you, and uh, you still think this letter and the policies in this letter should be honored? I think that uh, whoever signs a letter ought to honor that letter. Well, and Mr. Mike has in, in, uh, indicated that, you know, you were a fair chairman and it just seems to me you wrote the letter uh, in good faith and your your side believes that you're being fair they ought to honor that as well and I would ask you mr. chairman to vote with us against the motion because the motion reverses everything in the letter that you agreed to a couple days ago and uh, I we, we all worked real hard to figure out a way that would be uh, helpful and accommodating to all of us and I think you found a, the right compromise to do this and I would just encourage you to join with us to defeat uh, the motion by Mr. Cox, because Mr. Cox's motion overturns everything that we've agreed to in a mutual way. And with that, um, you know... With the gentleman yield. With the gentleman yield. With the gentleman. I, I will yield to the lady from New York. Okay. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, a school, some members of, from my district, some young ladies from the Spence School who are visiting with us. And, and I, I would really uh, like to add, before I, I uh, yield to the distinguished... Uh, a ranking member, uh, that I support my colleague uh, Gary Condit's statement. Three days ago, you agreed in this letter to, to actions and protocol, and then this amendment before us today is changing all of them. And I particularly object uh, to, to the items on page two that, in my opinion, will make it very difficult for members of Congress to be prepared for the hearings, as it, uh, it, it makes it uh, impossible for our staffs to be able to bring material to us and to review the material and bring it to us and make our, our, our research easier. So I, I really would like to go back to, to the comments earlier of Mr. Waxman. He came forward, I thought, with a very uh, reasoned and thoughtful request that the Cox Amendment be withdrawn and renegotiated like you did the, the letter you signed three days ago. That was negotiated of a number of weeks. You come in today, you have another amendment that totally changes everything and makes the ability of the minority members to, to, to be, be, be uh, prepared for the hearings, it hinders that somewhat. So I would now like to uh, yield to the distinguished uh, ranking member and, uh, and uh, back, back to Gary and to the distinguished member. Well, if, if he would yield. Yes, I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Waxman. But we were told, work together on a bipartisan basis. We did <laughs> negotiate rules with the chairman. He signed a letter memorializing the agreement. Now, the Republican members are saying, work with us on a bipartisan basis, but we're going to vote to overturn what the chairman agreed to. Now, who are we supposed to work with? I just find it astonishing 
that the Republican members would reject their own chairman's decision, because that's what they're proposing to do. They're proposing to reject what the chairman thinks is a fair process. And I can't understand how we're supposed to cooperate with an investigation where the Republicans won't even cooperate with their own chairman. The I thank you for yield. yielding. Will the gentleman the yield gentleman for one yield. question? For a quick question. Just where, where is the credibility when you don't even honor your own letter and, and may not, you know, and are overruling it? I mean, where is the credibility? I, I respectfully request uh, that, that we follow the ranking member's suggestion that we withdraw this amendment and work it out in a bipartisan way and get up. We have five other things on the agenda today. I yield, yield, back. I yield the gentleman. Thank you. I, I would be hard pressed to leave here without mentioning. First of all, I've seen this chairman uh, deliver the votes on his side of the aisle for a number of very tough votes in this committee. So if it's the chairman's position that his agreement should be honored, I don't think there should be any doubt about what the outcome in this vote ought to be. Uh, he's already suffered through enough slings and arrows, and I'm sure his own side of the aisle would not want to put him into an embarrassing position of not being able to carry an agreement in which he set forth with the minority. Secondly, to uh, my, my good friend Mr. Micah, who uh, in his early comments uh, seemed to be suggesting some threat on, you know, to the minority if we did not go along with this. L let me for myself state that I, there will be no cooperation on this motion, and if that means that you'll continue to, to seek to be uncooperative as we go forward, that is not a threat in which I'm impressed by. I think that what we need to do as a committee is to find some basis under which we can go forward. We've had nine months. We've not had one hearing. We can't release any depositions. There's no focus to this investigation. And now when we're at the brink of an agreement between the ranking member and the majority chairman about how to go forward, you all want to pull the rope from up under the chairman. Well, I think this is a very interesting set of circumstances. In reclaiming my time, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I think we ought to give bipartisanship a chance to uh, vote with us and let's defeat this motion. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I think a couple Mr. Cox, things. may I reclaim my time for one second? Sure. I, I've looked at page two of this and it says um, evidence or testimony taken in executive session which is the deposition, may only be released to the public with the express consent of the committee. It just occurs to this member that the earlier motion by uh, Mr. Waxman really upsets that part of the agreement by having a blanket uh, release of these depositions instead of coming back uh, to the committee if we're talking about going back and forth. Uh, maybe the gentleman has another explanation. Let me yield to Mr. Cox now and we can revisit this. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, uh, I listened carefully to the statements uh, on the other side. The gentlelady and the gentleman who spoke uh, suggested that the motion before us totally changes the proposal by the ranking minority member to the chairman, to which the chairman was hospitable. Uh, that kind of use of language, you know, totally and so on, uh, suggests either uh, intentional distortion or that people haven't read the motion, but every single material point of the understanding that was presented to the committee today is incorporated in my motion. The only changes are that now the depositions won't be physically carted away in violation of the protocol. Other documents covered by the protocol won't be physically carted away. And by the way, a lot of these depots have exhibits. And the exhibits themselves are not transcripts of depositions, but they are the kind of material that's covered by the protocols themselves. And in violation of the protocols, uh, uh, all of this stuff would be carted off away from the committee premises. Uh, quite frankly, it's an invitation to publish. And uh, when a depot transcript walks away from this committee uh, because a member's personal staff has it. What that means is on this very large committee, no member can read it. And one of the reasons that we wanted to amend it in that very minor respect is that we all want to have access because every single member, majority and minority, is covered by this in exactly the same way. And so it's only fair if the purpose of this is to facilitate 
members having access to this material to make sure uh, that it's not that it doesn't disappear that the committee doesn't know where it is that it's gone for 48 hours uh, and in that respect only uh, have we sought to uh, change this we also want to make sure that that we underscore that the purpose of staff's involvement here is to inform the members not to inform the leakers, not to you know, facilitate uh, a chain of, of leaks so that we put out information that ought not to be published uh, uh, until it's approved in accordance with the House rules. Well, the and this is, after all, executive session material. Finally, uh, let me say that uh, when I come to one of these hearings, if, if and I'm I hear, there's two and a half minutes on the clock. Uh, I, I will wrap up, Mr. Chairman. And I hear uh, either uh, Mr. Waxman or anybody on that side start talking specifically about you know, what's wrong with Charlie Tree laundering money uh, into the executive branch of our government or John Wong or what, what we're actually investigating here. And I hear the, a lick of concern about it. Then I'll know that there's an interest in bipartisanship. Uh, it may be that you view your job as being to slow down this investigation, to discredit it to change the subject or to frustrate it. And that's what this has been thus far. But that ought not to be the basis for bipartisan cooperation. And so uh, I think, uh, frankly, if we can do what we're talking about here today in this motion and release depositions to the public, even though our House rules prohibit that, the House rules, not the committee rules, but the House rules, that would be a big step forward. It would be a bipartisan step forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, lastly, although the chairman uh, uh, probably doesn't wish me to say this, uh, uh, the chairman is uh, taking a lot of flack from the ranking member on national television and otherwise. I'd like to see some dignity here so that uh, this investigation is, in fact, bipartisan, so that both the minority and the minor majority uh, will underscore the importance of the American people of getting to the bottom and getting to the facts. Uh, and that, more than anything, is what we need. And uh, with that, I yield back to my colleague. Thank you. I, I just, uh, I know we're gonna, let me just say, I think there may be some depositions that we can release without harming the investigation before this is over, and that would be in the discretion under this motion. Uh, without this, we wouldn't be able to do that at all. But a blanket uh, release of these, I think, would, would harm the investigation. I think the evidence is pretty clear on that. Yield. Be happy to yield. Look, uh, Mr. Cox is, first of all, absolutely wrong in his reading of his own amendment. The chairman's letter to me says that each committee member may designate in writing one staff person from the member's personal office to be a liaison to the committee. The Cox Amendment says, for the purpose of preparing for committee hearings or business meetings, committee staff may provide members with written summaries. Such summaries may not be shared with members' personal staff. He may not know what he's proposing. And what we see in this proposal is a rejection of what the chairman agreed to after bipartisan discussions with us. Now, you, you raised the issue of the vote to release the depositions. Right, which I didn't see committee. memorialized in this agreement, right? Yeah. Uh, we offered a proposal for the committee to vote to release the depositions that had been taken. That's been defeated. All we have now is this Cox proposal, which would reject the chairman's accommodations to us on a bipartisan basis. I thank you for yielding, and we've got a vote on the floor. I would yield back. Chair stands in recess to fall again. The House Government Reform Committee is discussing the ground rules for future hearings on campaign fundraising during the 1996 federal elections. We'll return to the hearing in a moment, but now a look at some upcoming programming. This morning, the Census Bureau holds a news conference on income, poverty, and health insurance for the nation and the states. We'll hear from the Bureau's Chief of Housing and Household Economic Division, and you can see live coverage beginning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2. Here are some of the other events our cameras will be covering today. White House Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles will be on Capitol Hill. The Senate Judiciary Oversight Subcommittee is reviewing procedures in the FBI's crime lab. 
Senate Democratic Leader Tom Daschle will provide an overview of what the Senate will be working on this week. At American University in Washington, D.C., a discussion of executive privilege in the Clinton White House and at the White House also. The President and First Lady will present the National Medal of Arts and National Humanity Medal. recess for the votes, we were debating at some length the motion by the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. Uh, I can't remember which side uh, was last to uh, debate the point. I believe it was the Republican Cox. side. Are there any members of the minority side that wishes uh, to speak on this? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Chairman, I, I want to assert my you want to assert your point of order? Uh, let's wait till Mr. Uh, Cox gets in. Might, might we have a vote? I think all of us are on both sides are repeating ourselves. I understand. Uh, and I would hope we would have a vote soon. I would hope we would too. Okay. <laughs> if we forego it, maybe they will be done soon. Is that unreasonable to expect? Reasonableness. I know. It left the room a long time ago. Where, where is, I'm trying uh, to bring it back. Where is Mr. Cox? I'm bringing it back before 6. <laughs> the, the, the chair recognizes Mr. Cox. Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to assert my point of order. Is that inappropriate at this time? Before we get to your point of order, I'd like to recognize Mr. Cox. Mr. Cox? Uh, I thank the chairman. Uh, while the votes on the floor have been a distraction uh, throughout our meeting today, they've also offered opportunities for us uh, to have sidebar conversations to try and work some of this out. And uh, what I have discussed with uh, members on both sides is the notion that uh, we ought to proceed on that portion of my motion which permits personal staff to have access to this and obviously facilitates uh, uh, members involvement in this to uh, accept the ranking members invitation to withdraw the portion uh, dealing with depositions and uh, uh, vote only on what's left and then uh, either here in Washington DC out in California uh, in whatever form or uh, uh, place uh, uh, the ranking member sees fit, I'd be happy to discuss this with him and work it out with him. Uh, and I'd yield the gentleman the yield to me for, for his thoughts. I thank you for yielding to me. When we started this debate many hours ago, I made a simple request to you that you withdraw your amendment. There was nothing pending. Our proposal was defeated. I asked if you would withdraw your proposal so we could have a chance to discuss it. You refused to do that. Now, I gather you've been informed that the parliamentarian would sustain a point of order that would uh, knock out uh, at least a portion of your amendment, so you seek only to offer one part of it. Now, the part you seek to offer undoes the agreement that the minority reached with the chairman on how our staffs would be involved in the depositions. So I certainly can't agree to what you're suggesting, let me renew again in the spirit of bipartisanship, fair play, and all of that, if you're sincere about it, withdraw your amendment completely and let's discuss further any changes you think you want to talk us into uh, after we've already reached an agreement with the chair and 
discuss through what ought to be the procedures for making depositions public if you have some ideas and are interested in giving us the chance to express our views to you in a meeting. So if you're going to withdraw your amendment, withdraw it all. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we, we will oppose your move. Of, California uh, me. of course, yield to the chairman. Uh, while we were on the floor during this last vote, uh, I also talked with the parliamentarian, Mr. Waxman. And uh, while I feel honor bound to uh, uh, vote um, the position I took in the letter, it was uh, expressed to me by the uh, parliamentarian that that letter would not be binding unless there was a vote of the committee. Uh, while I can, uh, uh, you know, make uh, recommendations, uh, there has to be a vote of the committee. And so he said that uh, the contents of the letter, while, and I, and I do feel honor bound to vote that way, uh, that there would have to be a vote of the committee to make that uh, letter enforceable. Would the gentleman yield? I would be could, pleased could I to I understand yield. the gentleman to say that you wanted to bifurcate or divide your amendment so that sections, uh, I would assume, uh, three, four, five, six, and seven would be the That's subject correct. matter of That's a correct. potential vote here. And that furthermore, you offered to the ranking member that you would negotiate uh, an agreement, um, uh, you know, either in California or in some other place that he deemed fit, you would be willing to sit down and negotiate something. Would that agreement that may be a part thereof then be subject again to some other um, uh, viewpoint. On yes, of course. Of it's always subject to the majority right. view on so, this committee. So, so the ranking member has engaged his time to negotiate with the chairman and arrived at an agreement. Uh, you want to avoid that by passage of these sections in which we've enumerated. No, to and the contrary, then, this puts into effect then, that agreement. And then start a new a negotiations between you and the ranking member. Well, uh, you know, if, if it were the view of the gentleman that discussions among members were counterproductive, then of course I would uh, uh, not engage them. But I didn't the, suggest anything about them being counterproductive. I'm trying to understand what you suggested in your opening statement. What I am suggesting is, uh, frankly, uh, uh, what we talked about here just a moment ago, uh, and that is trying to work something out that is acceptable. If okay. it is not acceptable, then uh, we do it as always by majority vote. If it's not acceptable, unanimously. Uh, but uh, I too had a conversation with the parliamentarian on the floor uh, and learned, uh, as I expected, uh, the following. Uh, first, that the letter agreement, uh, the letter of understanding what is what it really is, uh, between the chairman and the ranking minority member is in the form of a proposal to this committee. It cannot bind this committee in any way. Uh, and because we're dealing with executive session material, the only way to make it public is by majority vote of this committee. And so we have to deliberate as a committee. You also pointed out that uh, my effort to accommodate you by streamlining that procedure so we can get the stuff out faster, uh, doing it in writing rather than a business meeting like this is not a collegial meeting. And one of the reasons that the House rules requires a collegial meeting is that we're actually supposed to think about what's in this executive session material, uh, think about objections uh, on the basis of relevancy, confidentiality, and so on. And you know, again, it's, it's the parliamentarian points out, it's the House rules we're dealing with here, not the committee rules. That's the stricture we're operating under. So what I'm proposing that we do here is leave that discussion for another day, operate under the House rules in the meantime, as we have been doing, and then uh, uh, put into effect uh, the proposal, which I think is a sound one, for every single member to be able to de designate a personal staff member to come down here and review this and report back to them so that they don't have to do it personally. Under our current rules, that's not possible. So that is something that we all benefit from, majority and minority. And there's nothing in my proposal that treats the majority and the minority any differently. We're all treated the same. Mr. Uh, Chairman, may I be heard? Uh, yes, we'll listen to the gentleman from California. I, I want to address myself to the Republican members of this committee. Um, if we're going to work on a bipartisan basis, it means we talk to each other and try to figure out some ground rules. We spent a lot of time talking to your chairman about some ground rules, which he agreed to, now, and put in a letter to us saying these are the ground rules that he accepts. Now what we're being told, and I don't know if the parliamentarian will take this position or not, but the, the letter and our agreement means nothing because the committee has to adopt it. Maybe the committee has to adopt it by unanimous consent. 
what's clear to me is that the Republican members of this committee don't want to go along with your Republican chairman who's negotiated with us what we think is a fair way to proceed. That, that's where we are. Now, if that's where we are and we're going to renegotiate things, then let's renegotiate them and have Mr. Cox pull back his amendment completely and we talk about it. Instead, he's saying, oh no, he wants to put forward that part of the amendment that wouldn't be vulnerable to a point of order, he thinks, even though it's objectionable to us because it overturns explicitly the agreement we have with the chairman. Now, you, some of you were here when you were in the minority. Some of you came and you were already in the majority. But try to put yourself in our place. We wanted to work something out and did work something out with your chairman and you're pulling out the rug from under him. And now my request to Mr. Cox as your vice chairman is that we have an opportunity to have some discussion face to face to work things out further and we're being told no. So I, I, I'm sort of, uh, don't know what to make of this. Would I've you been yield? told that we should work on a, first of all, I've been told that we should really care about ca campaign finance abuses. Mr. Cox, I do care about campaign finance abuses. I care about them, whether it was from a Democratic president or a Republican candidate for president or a Democratic congressman or a Democratic candidate for Congress, Republican congressman or a Republican candidate for Congress. I've asked for a serious campaign finance investigation. This committee has not undertaken, in my view, a serious one. Now, if we're going to be serious, it ought to be one that's on a bipartisan basis. And the first time you needed us was to give you two-thirds vote for immunity for those witnesses. And we agreed to it. We have not had any other vote in this committee where you haven't had the majority on a party-line basis ramming things down our throat that we objected to. I heard you say that this five-member committee was something I wanted. It wasn't something I wanted. It was something that you all worked on and forced on us. Would you now, yield? If you want to offer a rule change, rejecting what the chairman agreed to, outvote the chairman and us, then go ahead and do it. But why do you think that's going to get us into any kind of cooperative frame of reference? Would you yield? Certainly. Uh, I believe what I said is that we adopted the protocol and the bipartisan five-person working group uh, in direct response to the member's objection that we had a chairman who could unilaterally do things. Uh, I was here uh, for those discussions, and it was the uh, point made repeatedly. We cannot have a chairman with the unilateral power to do these things. And now, uh, uh, arguing the other side of the point, you're back here saying that the entire majority should not be able to uh, read and review and have uh, uh, any input into the protocols that uh, you're proposing for the committee because you talked to one guy. Uh, <laughs> one guy? We're achieving my time. I talked to one guy. He's your chairman, for God's sake. Who, who you say should not have the unilateral right. Wait a second. I have right. my time, and I'm not yielding to you. Who, who you say should not I'm have not the unilateral right. I'm not yielding to anybody. It's my time, and I'm going to do uh, my talking on my time. I talk to your chairman. If you don't want him as your chairman, then replace him, and then tell us who we should negotiate with. That's what I can. And the simple request we gave, asked of you, is not to, to, to uh, try to ram through something right now. We've been here all day. It's a quarter to six. Now, I don't know what you want to do. If you want to go ahead with a vote on your proposal, then let's go ahead with a vote on your proposal. And if the mem Republican members want to support it over our objections and the chairman's objection, then go ahead and do it. And if, you, if you, we get an agreement, then you get weasel words like, oh, this is what he agreed to, but it really requires the unanimous consent, or it doesn't really go into effect because the parliamentarian said the committee's got to vote. This isn't our understanding of the of where we are when we negotiated this agreement. Our understanding was a chairman can talk to the ranking minority member on process, we can reach an agreement, that's what we did, and now you're all trying to weasel out of it. Well, I just want you to all know that's what we see you doing. And don't Steve Horn tell me how I don't care about really going after Charlie Tree. I'm not hiding Charlie Tree. I don't know where he is. And I don't want the rest of you to blast us and say that we're not cooperating. When we try to cooperate, we get kicked in the teeth. So I, uh, I have a point of order I'll make or not make. Or what I just want to know what you all want to do. I'll Mr. yield Chairman? to Mr. Cox. 
You're the leader of the committee. Tell us, Mr. Cox, what do you want to do? Mr. Chairman, maybe Mr. recognize. Mr. Cox, you have Thank a you. motion. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, in response, if I may, to the point uh, raised by the ranking member. Uh, hey, Mr. Cox, I, I would suggest that uh, we've had so much debate. Well, why don't you make your motion uh, to amend your motion, and uh, if it receives unanimous... For precisely what I was prepared to do. Good. Uh, Reserving a point of order, and I wish to assert my point of order, you cannot amend an amendment that's out of order. Go call the parliamentarian, he'll tell you. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, subject to the ruling of the parliamentarian, I propose in the alternative to strike paragraphs numbered one and two from my motion and de redesignate the subsequent paragraphs, beginning with paragraph number one. Alternatively, I shall withdraw my motion and present a new motion with the paragraphs so redesignated so that they will not be subject to a 10 to inches point of order. So you're withdrawing your, your previous motion and replacing it with a... Uh, subject to uh, the ruling of the parliamentarian, uh, I shall either redesignate them or if we're going to be put to a, a vote on uh, points of order, then I'll just withdraw it and offer a new motion. With, with the amendment is withdrawn. The clerk will redesignate the... Mr. The Chairman, I'm going to cooperate. Motion. I'm going to cooperate. Mm -hmm. I can make a point of order, but if you're all determined to treat us as it appears you're going to, then I, I will withdraw my point of order. You can offer any amendment you want. You can ram it down our throats, and that'll be it. So I, I withdraw my point of order. Gentleman withdraws his point of order. The clerk will report the, uh, the motion by Mr. Cox. Mr. Cox moves that the committee adopt the following procedures regarding the handling of deposition transcripts. Solely for the purpose of keeping members of the committee informed about the progress of the investigation into illegal foreign payments, campaign finance law violations, and related violations of the laws. I ask unanimous consent that the motion be considered as read. I, I object. We, we want heard. to get a chance to read Objection it. Objection is heard. Read the uh, motion. In all particular subjects to applicable or provisions of document protocol, each member of the committee may designate one person here and after designated staff for his or her personal staff to review deposition transcripts, which are considered executive session material. I ask unanimous Students consent the amendment be considered as read. Is there objection? Mr. Chairman, I move the previous question. Previous question has been moved. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying no. no. You moved the previous question. You voting on the previous question? I did. Uh, independent chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Previous question is ordered. The question now comes on the motion by the gentleman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I ask for a roll call vote. Gen gentleman from California asked for a roll call vote, and a roll call vote will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton. I'll pass at this point. Mr. Burton passes. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mrs. Morella? Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes yes. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Aye. Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Mr. McHugh? Uh, Mr. Chairman, is it in order for me to ask for the record, are we voting on ordering the previous question no. or the previous question? We are voting on the motion itself. The previous question has been ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will vote aye. Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. What do you mean? 
Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette, pass. Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Portman? Aye. Mr. Portman votes aye. Mr. Waxman? Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Condon? Would, uh, could, could I have an inquiry, Mr. Chairman? What are we voting on? We're voting on the motion itself. The previous question was done by voice vote. All right. Mr. Condon votes no. Mr. Condon votes no. Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. <coughs> Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Bogoyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Davis of Illinois votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Ford? Mr. Gilman? Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Uh, aye. Mr. Hastert votes aye. Am I recording? Mrs. Morella? Aye. Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Ms. Ross Layton? Mr. McIntosh? Aye. Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Lantos? Mr. Allen? Mr. Ford? Mr. Chairman, have the absentees been called? Yes, Mr. Chairman, they have. Would the uh... chair votes uh, no? The chair votes no. And I'd like to ask, Mr. Chairman, how Mr. Latourette's recorded. Mr. Latourette is on a pass. Mr. Latourette votes present. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Waxman, you recorded as a no. Clerk will report the A's and A's. Mr. Chairman, there are 19 A's and 18 A's and one present. The motion by the gentleman from California passes. We have some uh, other business uh, come before the committee. Why do you want me to catch you? I move the committee adjourn. We we have some uh, members. I, I would prefer that. Uh, uh, I want. I ask for motion to adjourn. I think that takes precedent over everything. I ask for a vote on it. A motion to adjourn is uh, is immediate and non-debatable. Uh, those in favor of adjournment will signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.
Those opposed will signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Meetings adjourned. Congress returns from its weekend recess today. Lawmakers are working on the new federal budget that goes into effect October 1st. The House is working on funding for the Departments of Commerce, Justice, and State, and the Senate on campaign finance reform. So we talked with the Capitol Hill correspondent about what's coming up this week. Janet Hook of the Los Angeles Times. As the week ended, the Senate began debate on campaign finance reform, but just a few days ago, nobody expected that to happen very soon at all. What happened in these last few days that brought it to the floor? Well, it is the end of a week of a lot of twists and turns in the uh, congressional debate about reforming the campaign finance system. And uh, as you say, it's wound its way onto the Senate floor after um, a lot of uh, doubt about whether it would ever end up there. Earlier in the week, um, President Clinton actually threatened to keep Congress in session extra weeks or months at the end of this year in order to ensure that they debate campaign finance reform. Um, after that, the Senate leaders actually managed to reach an agreement about that they would, in fact, bring up campaign for reform before the end of the year. Um, it was quite a surprise when last night Trent Lott announced that he would be bringing the bill to the floor, but it actually, um, he said that he found sort of a window in the Senate schedule that there was time to debate it. I think also there's a certain tactical advantage to the Republicans to having taken people by surprise, and it might be something that Lott would just as soon get over with and move on to other things. This commonly referred to as the uh, McCain-Feingold mm -hmm. bill. How much did the sponsors of the bill have to give in what they wanted to get it? to a position to be brought up? Well, I, I th they have proposed uh, some changes in the bill and compromises, but I don't think that that's what got Trent Lott to bring the bill to the floor. I think in general, the political climate is such that nobody wants to be seen as obstructing campaign reform. Everyone wants to be seen as critical of the current system, but I'm not sure that there's uh, enough consensus behind any one proposal for reforming the system that we're actually going to see any changes in law come out of this debate. But this does guarantee that we'll be hearing a lot more about it over the next, at least the next week in the Senate. Well, as that debate starts in the Senate, what are the chances that it will be up in the House? Well, the House has actually had a, um, an interesting week um, on this front as well. The leaders in the House haven't made any firm commitment to address campaign finance reform. Um, and as a result, House Democrats have been, uh, ma have mounted a, a form of protest against this. Um, and it's taken the form of them demanding uh, numerous time-consuming roll call votes. And it's sort of tied up the House. It's made, made it harder to move quickly on the legislation that's before the House. Um, and they're hoping that somehow, if it's disruptive enough, it'll pressure the Republican leaders to schedule campaign reform debate. Dick Armey, the other day, the majority leader of the House, indicated that they probably would bring it up before the end of the year. Um, Newt Gingrich was sending mixed signals that they might bring it up, but it sure wouldn't look like the McCain-Feingold bill if they did. What kind of pressure is the leadership feeling to bring something up? I think, I, as I said, I think right now it's, um, it's sort of the nuisance factor of, having, of trying to run the House with so much disruption on the floor. I think they're also subject to some of the same political pressures that, that the Senate is responding to, that, that there's enough sort of uh, 
bad publicity about the campaign system these days that they feel uh, political pressure from outside the Capitol to, to, to show some responsiveness to those concerns. But I think House members are, are somewhat more uh, committed to the current system than senators, and that there, there's, uh, uh, there's always been more reluctance to even consider campaign finance reform on the House side than on the Senate side. As someone who's covered the Hill